Hello, everyone, and welcome to ESPN's NCAA Tournament Special. We will run down the field over the next couple of days. Today, we'll start things off with the West and the East regions. I'm joined, as usual, by Jim Valvano and Dick Vitale. We'll hear from you gentlemen momentarily. But first, let's take a look at the brackets and find out once again where everyone is. We'll start things off with the number one team in the nation, Duke facing Campbell. Remember, Campbell is a Baptist school, so they couldn't play on Sunday. They put them in the Saturday draw. But they'll have to say their prayers against Duke. Texas and Iowa, Missouri and West Virginia. Seton Hall and LaSalle. LaSalle can knock down the three, so Seton Hall will have to get out on the perimeter. Meanwhile, the game's in Worcester. Syracuse against Princeton. UMass gets to say close to home as they take on Fordham. UNC Charlotte faces Iowa State. Johnny Orr very happy here on our air yesterday as he got in. And Kentucky against Old Dominion. The Monarchs with the worst record receiving that automatic bid. They have just 15 wins. In the West, the number one seed is UCLA. These games in Tempe, Arizona. They'll take on Robert Morris. Louisville and Wake Forest. Very interesting matchup in the first round. DePaul facing New Mexico State. The highest DePaul has been seeded since 1987. And Oklahoma with a very high number four seed. They'll take on Southwestern Louisiana. Meanwhile, these games in Boise. Georgetown and South Florida. Another one of those great early matchup south florida out of the metro florida state a team that south florida has beaten if they have to face them again in the second round and they'll face montana out of the big sky no team from the big sky has won a tournament game since 1983 lsu and byu indiana and eastern illinois the hoosiers haven't reached the final eight since 1987. now as we look down that field very interesting note since 1979 no more than two number one seeds in the same year have reached the final four. What chances do the top seeds have? Duke, <laughs> it's a waltz. I think they're going right through. A and waltz in the park. Waltz in the park. And Campbell can't play on Sunday. They may not be able to play on Saturday either. It's going to be <laughs> awfully tough, I think, for Campbell. Well, Jim, I'll tell you what. I have a better chance of beating Robert Redford out in the good-looking contest than Campbell has of beating Ooh. Duke. I think that UCLA, no. though, is going to be an early casualty. Jimmy Herrick, Unfortunately, I think the UCLA Bruins will stumble. Now, my definition of an early casualty, when you're a number one seed, means even in the second and third round. And I think they will be a goner when they get there, especially if they have to play Oklahoma. But I think they may even have trouble with Louisville if Louisville gets by its first match. I disagree vehemently with Ooh. Dick regarding uh, Campbell and the Robert Redford. I think that, <laughs> that Campbell has a much better chance of beating Duke than you do in the Robert Redford contest. I, I, no, no, I have a better chance of growing a thick crop of hair <laughs> like you. All right, let's talk about UCLA a little bit more. UCLA is a team that's pretty hot right now. I mean, beating Arizona in that game, big victory for them. John, I think the bottom half of the bracket is spectacular. And here you go, there's UCLA against Arizona. McLean hitting that jumper. You can't let that guy shoot it. He's terrific, huh, Dick? Tracy Murray hit the J there. Well, Tracy Murray's a long-range shooter. I really question some of their perimeter play in terms of their backcourt. And I think on a neutral floor, they can have some problems in a later round. Remember, they won those games at home, John. They won them on their own facility. They were in a little stumble. I don't know. They might feel the pressure. Remember last year, Penn State, first round. Now, I don't have them going uh, all the way. I think the bottom half of the bracket is spectacular. And I think you got some chances of getting that game that we all want to see. And that's LSU against Georgetown oh. and morning. Against, against Shaquille O'Neal. Oh, that's a long way off, though. That's got to be I'm three just games. I'm talking about things Ooh, which might that's happen. a long way. All you. right, we'll take a look at further predictions a little bit later on. But first, let's remind you that tomorrow, we will look at the rest of the field in the Southeast and the Midwest. Right now, here's a look at those brackets, and we'll get into them a little bit more tomorrow. First with the Midwest, Kansas, the number one seed.
Welcome back to our tournament special here. We continue to run things down. We'll start off in the West Regional. The number one seed, the UCLA Bruins. Now, we've heard conflicting reports about what you guys feel exactly will happen in this one. UCLA Louisville, though, is a matchup. If you look ahead, and the other coaches won't want you to do that, but you like that one. Oh, I think that could be a spectacular matchup. We've uh, had that before. You know, in the past, you've seen some... Uh, great UCLA Louisville games and hey take a look there's the wizard 1975 look at Danny Crum he's got the polyester Richard Washington in the jumper and John Wood got his last NCAA championship now we take it to 19 there's Larry Brown All right there's Larry Farmer he's hugging him right there this was the championship well uh-uh Larry Brown couldn't get it done Daryl Griffith they got it done put on cut the Mets down right there so they've had some great matchups and I think they're gonna could have another one that was the doctors of dunk. I really think Louisville could have problems against Wake Forest and Rodney Rogers. I really do. This is not a vintage Louisville team. This is not a sensational team. So people are anticipating that matchup. I think that'd be a problem. I think Wake Forest definitely could beat the uh, Louisville team. Oh, that the Hoyas are going to win this game. I also think. Florida oh, that's really State. going on a limb. I really, oh wow. I said they're going really to win. on the limb. <laughs> Alonzo Mourning, and you're picking them. <laughs> Give me a timeout, baby. I thought you just said South Florida was going to win. Yeah, they are. They're going to win. <laughs> well, I right. said Georgetown's going to win, and then Florida State's going to be Montana. You have a great matchup there of yeah. speed and quickness against a club like play half court. All right, the, the committee. We talked about this yesterday. They have to have a oh, sense okay. of humor. They have no. to do this. Uh -uh. I mean, Indiana possibly facing LSU takes oh. you back to 1987. No. No, John does it. Look at that. What do you guess? Look at Dick. There's your man. Dale and Bobby and going you, at it. Bob wants to use the phone. He wanted to make a call right there. Should have been slapped with a T right there, baby. But I'll tell you one thing, you know, the committee, I get a kick, they say the computer, the whole uh -oh. bit. Hey, Jim, you know and I know. They sit down and they look and they see, possible Indiana and LSU? Let's hook Bob Bobby you, and Mr. And Mr. So? Dale Brown. You know, they could have played, I think you pointed it out, John, in our production meeting three years ago, I believe, over right. in Hartford. Mm -hmm. They had it set up Indiana and also LSU, but they both, they both got lost. You, don't, yeah. you don't think it, it just goes to the computer and it kind of comes out that way? A nice says, smoke filled it says room. We're going to do that. Or, or when you were coaching way back about 20 years ago and you had to play? 1977, they got me Johnny Ware, who last night said he kicked my. Yes, hey, yes. Johnny, here's a little postscript. No, for no, you. I'm talking 86, no, 81, six. and we wore him out okay. that the next night the number one team in the nation, Michigan, went down. Right. They went down to North Carolina, Charlotte, and Cornbread Maxwell. I'm, and that's when my guy, Al, cut the nets down. Big Al with that yes, Marquette team. I had to get that PS in. I know. You, time you, ago. you said you'd get it in and you did. <laughs> uh, I really think, you know, you take a look at it, and I know that when I was coach NC State, and all of a sudden we got a first round game, I looked, and guess what? We're playing Norm Sloan, the ex coach Whoa. of NC State, Florida against NC State. So I have a feeling that it's not just in the computer and out right, of pocket. Exactly. I think they, they, they do some interesting matchups. So who do you guys like out of the West? to reach the Western Final. Oh, I like uh, LSU. I love LSU. I think they're going to play UCLA. And uh, Dick likes... Uh, Dick, I like Indiana. And Dick is wrong. Is I, got Indiana, wrong I got Indiana and Oklahoma. I think Indiana's <laughs> really been struggling shooting the basketball. I think the best Why thing... Why are you picking them? Well, I think the best thing that happened to them, Jim, I really mean this, is being shipped out to the West to get away from all the pressure and all the playing in their local area. And I think this is the best thing that happened to them. And Ohio State certainly deserved the number one seed. Oh, I don't know how you're thinking of it. Well, talking about the Big oh, Ten, okay. everybody had Indiana locked uh, in there. <laughs> I'm not sure Bob Knight would agree that it's the best thing that happened to them. All right, we'll continue with more in just a moment. But first, let's take a look at what we'll do for the rest of the week. We will be with you from the time they tip it off. Thursday and Friday, specials from 5 to 6, 7 to 8, 11.30 to 12, and 12.30 to 1 a.m. And we talk about interesting matchups. Well, how about the matchup Jim Beheim has in Syracuse? this year's pick to go up against Princeton. Will this be the year that Princeton causes even more havoc? We'll talk to Jim Beheim in just a moment. Victory in the Big East Tournament. Jim Beheim, congratulations on that first of all, but uh, I think we have an interesting question for you off the stop. <laughs> I'm sure you do. I've been listening. Yeah, well, Jim, right? I just want to say, first of all, I, con I congratulate you on your, on your championship. Dick did not pick you to win. I picked you to win the Big East <laughs> early in the year. I was just wondering, do you feel a little snake bit by getting the draws you get? A Richmond team, Dick Tarrant, a tough team. You beat them. They say you're supposed to, but they're a terrific team. Now you've got Pete Carrill and Princeton. It's like a no-win situation. Well, the great thing about these games is last year I heard how good Richmond was, how much the, you know, how easy it'd be for them to beat you. And, uh, you know, then they did beat us, and it was like, how can they beat you? 
<laughs> uh, you know, I, I, hope I, I hope I don't hear that thing this year, but uh, it's tough in the tournament. Uh, Richmond, I thought, was a very good team. I think Princeton's a very good team. Uh, the one thing that helps us, I think, is the Big East has kind of turned into the low-scoring league in the country. And so we're kind of used. We just played two 50-point games in New York, and, you know, we're kind of used to that speed. It's not, we're not as fast in the Big East as we used to be. It's a little bit more slowed down, a little bit more defensive-oriented this year. Jim, two questions I like to ask. Part one, you just mentioned it, the tempo, the scoring situation in the Big East, really down. Why with better athletes? And number two, you look right now, Jim, you got, if you win that game, a trip up to Massachusetts to play potentially Massachusetts and Worcester. I mean, that's got to be a tough one. And your feelings also on the fact that the Big East really not recognized like the Atlantic 10. Does that bother you? Well, we got five teams, and I think that's pretty good. I think this year was a great year in the Atlantic 10, and I think Massachusetts probably playing as well as uh, almost anybody in the country uh, maybe with one exception i think down there in uh, north carolina there's a team might be playing a little better but uh, it's a tough draw uh playing up there but uh, you know our athletic director's on the committee and i guess he <laughs> i guess he doesn't like me anymore <laughs> jim we're gonna let you ride high for a little bit we're gonna take you back to yesterday's win over georgetown fifth time that you met the Hoyas in the championship game and the first time that you got the job done. Can you walk us through a little bit the final few seconds? Joey Brown hitting this shot. This, this shot was unbelievable. You know, we, we said push out on him. We went to David isolation. I didn't even see that it was Alonzo, and, and that's just an unbelievably tough shot. Uh, uh, the end, the last play, we just tried to push up on him, and we didn't think they'd have time to throw it inside. And, uh, we're fortunate that they missed the shot. Usually they make it against us, but you know, every time we play, every time somebody mentions that it was a good win, they mention that we lost four straight. So I don't know if I feel that good today or not. We're only one and four against them in the finals. <laughs> Jim, talk, talk a little bit about your team at the beginning of the year. I mean, obviously most people felt this was not a Syracuse team was going to do what it, what it did, and yet I remember talking to you at a, at a clinic before <laughs> the season. You felt pretty good about the team, and I didn't know why you felt good about it. Talk about the development of the team and some of the leaders and why you think you are where well, you are today. You know, I respect, I think you've got tremendous knowledge, but the last two years you thought we were terrible and <laughs> we've had two of our best years, so just keep thinking that way and saying that. But this team has just played well together. We've been behind in 14 out of our last 16 games by 8 to 10 points, and, and we've won a few. Uh, somehow we've come back and won a few of those games, but it's been a very determined team, and we've really shot the ball pretty well from the outside for us. and. And, you know, nobody, the, the problem, Dick hasn't had anything to talk about this year because we're making our free throws. <laughs> so, you know, that's the only thing. We've taken away most of his material. <laughs> hey, Jim, no. And after our one-on-one -on -one game last summer, he hasn't even talked about me at all. Wow, <laughs> is he bad in that hey, one? Hey, Jim, you bury me left and right. I tell you, I was the biggest cupcake you ever played in your life, but you got a really outstanding diaper dandy. Tell us a little bit about Lawrence Moten. He's been brilliant all year. Well, Lawrence Moton's one of those guys that nobody wanted out of high school. Look at this. This is one of the best moves I've ever seen. I, I don't even know how he made this move. I'm not sure. I asked Lawrence before the game. I said, you know, you got to go home this summer. You need to win. He just said, yeah, I know it, Coach. And, you know, he played probably the best first half of the year for us. He's an under-recruited player. You know, we've gone to Washington, D.C. a couple times since I've been the head coach, and we came away with a guy named Sherman Douglas and Lawrence Moton. We've got to get back down there more often and find somebody that nobody else wants. <laughs> hey, but, you, yeah. you better get I, ready for that backdoor cut now. You better run to the gym and get ready because, you know, little Tony Corral is going to run that backdoor to death. Well, the way we're playing in the 50s with teams that are more up-tempo, this might be a 30 to 35-point <laughs> game. And, you know, if it's on television, everybody's going to, you know, whoever's doing the game is going to be taking a nap during the play-by-play. <laughs> All right, Jimmy, thank you very much. Spend the rest of the week, anytime you go into a restaurant or you go into your office, you go in your home, go in through the back door. That might make it a little easier when it comes down to the later in the week. Thanks for thank, joining thank us. Thank you, John. I don't know how you work with those guys. They hey, look at his hairstyle. You. Is it extra pay or what, John? I do. I get danger pay. Hey, Certainly. John, look at his hairstyle. It's going deeper and deeper back on me. I mean, catching me. I don't think you need to talk about anybody's hairstyle, Dick. All right, we'll come back with the East region in just a moment. But first, here's a sneak peek at the East right now. Coming up, Christian Leitner, number one.
So right now, let's turn our thoughts to the East region. Duke, of course, is the number one team in the nation. They'll get to play in Greensboro as the number one seed, and they'll take on the Camels of Campbell. Let's take a look at the East region right now. Texas and Iowa, Missouri and West Virginia. Seton Hall and LaSalle, a great matchup I like early on. But UNC Charlotte facing Iowa State. That one comes up a little bit later on in the second part of the bottom part of the region. Yo, I, I really like uh, this uh, UNC Charlotte team. I think they got the hidden gem in Henry Williams. I think they're underrated, and I think they can do a good job. There he is. There, look at him. He's a terrific player. They got a terrific team. Look at him. Stop up, pull up. Bingo! Knock down a three. I just think that Iowa State's going to have a handful with this basketball team. Williams is really a clutch player, too. Likes the ball late in the game. But Johnny Ward's got some good players, Jim. He mm -hmm. really does. This Tim Mikalik, a freshman, could really shoot the ball. And you got to remember this. Iowa State's beaten some quality teams. They beat Kansas. They beat teams in the Big 8, the toughest conference in basketball. So Iowa State, they beat Iowa and they beat Minnesota also. Yeah. In fact, beat Minnesota at Minnesota, something that Indiana and Michigan couldn't do. Now, Seton Hall, Missouri is a potential matchup. You like this one. You love it. Well, I like the matchup because I really love Anthony Peeler. I think that Seton Hall's been playing great basketball. They've won like 11 out of their last 13. They're playing well late. Terry DeHair has been really brilliant for them. But I think in the open court, Anthony Peeler is the best. He's had a tough time in tournament play. In four tournament games, he's only scored a total of 20 points. And also, in the first round, Missouri has really, really found it to be exceptionally tough to win. They lost one year to Northern Iowa in the first round. They lost to Rhode Island, Xavier, and UAB in the first round. But I love Anthony Peeler. I think he's ready to break out. I think they'll beat West Virginia. And I think they're going to create a lot of problems for Seton Hall, who will get by LaSalle, despite yeah. the great score of Randy Andy Woods. Woods he's a great three-point shooter. Yeah. We've seen him. Yeah, we did. Now, I know we were going that Seton Hall-Missouri matchup pretty quick. I think some other teams have something to say about it. But I happen to love P.J. Calissimo's team. I love Seton Hall. I think that what P.J. has done, he's come into his own as a, as a, a coach in tournament time who builds to that point. Once you get to the Final Four, as you did, your goals change. And so you don't mind a stretch of games where you don't play as well. And I think they do the two things that are so important in postseason. Number one is they play great half-court man-to-man defense. And number two is they have a nice set. They have that nice half-court set, and P.J. knows how to uh, coach offensively what he wants to do. Yeah. Caver's going to have to really play well, John. He's up and down as a player. He's going to have to give him some consistency in the backcourt to balance it out with Terry DeHere. But P.J. Carlissimo, I agree with Jimmy. His name ends in A-E-I-O-U. No, and those guys have a way. No, they have a no. way with that emotion and that linguini <laughs> to get their teams fired up in tournament time. But they have a guy by the name of Jerry Walker, too, who may be the Not best 6'6 six, six post player in the country right now. Let's look at the rest of the bracket, the games being played in Worcester. Syracuse and Princeton. You heard from Jim Beheim about that one. You getting to stay close to home they'll take on Fordham there's UNC Charlotte against Iowa State that matchup we talked about and Kentucky taking on Old Dominion Rick Pitino right well, on the show Rick Pitino was a big star in 1987 with a three-point shot in Providence and they went to the final four they really shoot the trifecta and they're not afraid to let it fly they live by it it is absolutely their strength from the perimeter there's no question about it, and you can take a look at the numbers, Vic. Uh, we say you live by it. We talked about this the other day. 26 wins. There it is, almost 40%. When they lose, 24. However, in the SEC tournament, they only shot 30% from three-point, and they won. So, what does that tell you? Well, they got more than just a three-point shot, but it's right. still a vital part of their game. There's yes, no doubt is. about it. Mashburn, to me today, is one of the premier players in basketball. Versatile, inside, outside, and a power guy on the interior. And Patino's one of those guys in tournament play again. Emotion, motivating. Dale Brown's great at that time during tournament. Certain guys have that way to get their teams in one-game shots to really play well. You were great at that. I have to pat you on the back for that. <laughs> That's a side, by the way. That's not his back. But anyway, get to your picks now in the East. Who do you like? <laughs> well, who do I like in the East? Let you start no, first. No, I, like, I can't hold my breath. I like the East. Duke going up against Kentucky. Ooh. But I think that the Dukies will go out and they defend the three as well as anybody. And they're going right back to the Final Four. We got Kabasi going against Linguini oh. right there. Krzyzewski <laughs> against Patino. Duke and Kentucky, what a matchup that would be. All right, you gentlemen agree on that one. Hard to believe it doesn't happen too often. Let's remind you, the NIT, you can see that here on ESPN. Starting on Wednesday night, Virginia and Villanova will tip things off.
That's the east and the west. Tomorrow we'll look at the southeast and the Midwest. Dick, what do you have to say about that? Well, in the Midwest, I've just said simply, I can't believe that the committee, they could have really made themselves look super by not putting Kansas, first of all, in the region to play at Kemper Arena. I just don't buy that advantage. They shouldn't have it. And I, I, I can't believe I'm agreeing with you again. There's no question. I don't like it. I went through it. It shouldn't happen. All right, y'all have time to talk about that tomorrow when we do the southeast and the Midwest. That's it for the east and the west. We'll see you again tomorrow. Good night, everyone. On CBS Sports, the NCAA Basketball Championship. Hi, I'm Patrick Swayze. Now, they say that some teams don't have a ghost of a chance at winning the tournament. But I guess that's why they play the game. It's March Madness. And hi, good everybody. I'm Pat O'Brien, along with my partner, Mike Francesa. And uh, this is as clean as this desk is going to look, I think. That's about it. <laughs> I suppose it's fair to say, let the madness begin. I've heard that before. <laughs> so much is up in the air. Here in the uh, metropolitan New York area, snow is in the air. Tomorrow, believe it or not, spring will be in the air. A lot of office pools are up in the air, and soon there will be plenty of basketballs in the air. 64 teams are poised, and Mike, what is your uh, traffic report on the road to the Final Four? You know, Pat, I think about the enormity of the tournament. This is my 11th for CVS. When it started, it was really a tournament for the basketball diehard. Now it's a tournament for the country, from the office pool to the college campus. Enormous excitement everywhere. Everyone wants to know who's going to win the 8-9 game in the Southeast. I mean, that's what it's become. It's become a huge event, and we have the best seat in the house. We certainly have the best seat in the house, and that uh, means you do, too. Yep. Let's set the day for you. Uh, we've got action happening across the country today. We begin in Cincinnati, where Miami of Ohio meets North North Carolina in Southeast region play. David Scott, who earned his reputation as a super sub, led Miami to the Mid-America Conference Tournament title. For the Tar Heels, Hubert Davis is their go-to guy. He paced Carolina with a 22-point per game average. In Greensboro, East action begins in the region there with LaSalle and Seton Hall. Randy Woods, the three-point bomber and fifth leading scorer in the nation, guides the Explorer offense. He's some player, folks. And Terry DeHare comes in for Seton Hall. Terry and the Pirates, he's on a quest of a 23-game streak in which he has scored in double digits. And then in Milwaukee, the Midwest will tip off with Murray State against Arkansas. And here's a look at this afternoon's doubleheader games, which begin at approximately 240 out west in Boise, where South Florida meets Georgetown. Some of you will see West Virginia and Missouri, that's Anthony Peeler, Stanford versus Alabama, or Pepperdine against Memphis State. In areas of regional interest, we'll have Montana and Florida State, that's a good team, and uh, approximately 10 after 5. Tonight, uh, Jim Nance and Billy Packer will anchor our primetime coverage, doubleheader, which begins for most of the country at 8 Eastern time with Brigham Young and Louisiana State, or Houston and Georgia Tech. In areas of local interest, we'll start at 7.30 Eastern with Mississippi Valley State versus Ohio State, or Campbell and Duke. Then, at approximately 10 Eastern, we'll have our late doubleheader games. Eastern Illinois versus the Hoosiers of Indiana, Yukon against Nebraska, Northeast Louisiana versus Southern Cal, and Iowa against the Texas Longhorns. And that is a lot of basketball. What are the keys in these opening rounds? You know, Pat, I don't care if you're a one seed and you're playing Campbell or Mississippi Valley State or whomever you may be playing. You have to get that first game under your belt. That is a key for any team in this tournament, Duke included. And for teams that have struggled into the tournament, like a UConn or teams that haven't played well, you can gain momentum in the first round. If a shot drops, if a foul shot doesn't go in for the other side, you can gain momentum and get on a roll in the tournament. It doesn't matter how you played if you have talent and you can get on that roll anything can happen and you'll watch it happen throughout the first round and how in awe are these smaller teams of the big teams like Miami of Ohio they watch North Carolina on TV every day I would be <laughs> the problem is that you hope they don't line up and ask for autographs. So I like you're honest about these things. We'll be back with a look at how March Madness is sweeping the nation as the road to the final four rolls on from New York Is it that we're just talking here how exciting this is and as we approach uh, tip off uh, to tourney time we find that we're not the only ones who are putting our normal lives on hold during March Madness. Who do you think is going to win tonight? Duke? No way man. North Carolina all the way. They just blow away Duke. The ACC doesn't matter if they won the tournament man. They're going to go all 
all the way. What about UCLA, though, down here? I love UCLA for a dark horse. Okay, they're two dark horse. What about Oklahoma State? They're going to get UCLA. They're going to get by Indiana. They're 27 and 2. Look at Oklahoma State. Yeah. Those are just numbers to me, Joe. Nah, nah, nah. numbers to me. <laughs> Duke, Arkansas, Indiana, and Oklahoma State. You sure? Bacon burger, and a hard roll, fries, cheeseburger. What are those giving out? Can you hold, please? Well, man, I got the paper right here breaking down for you. I got the whole championship. Well, how we gonna play Kansas on Friday? Kansas? I, Cincinnati going all the way. All those other teams are just born. If Cincinnati don't win the whole thing, uh, I'm leaving <laughs> the United States for 50 days and I'm not coming back. Right. Well, you got it. Oh, yeah, look at mine. No, I want to see. You got this guy winning there? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, road to the Final Four uh, continues after work for your local stations. Big day of basketball all over the country today. Get out your brackets, That's folks. It. It's tourney time. The one thing you don't need for the next few days is remote control right there. Stay That's right it. here. Welcome back to our New York studios. I'm Pat O'Brien. He's Mike Francesa, my traveling partner, along the road to the Final Four. This is that rare moment when all 64 teams can savor those dreams of grandeur. And today, round one begins, and teams will start falling by the wayside. We'll start everybody off in a couple of moments at Cincinnati, where Miami of Ohio meets North Carolina. In other early action, it's LaSalle and Seton Hall in the east, while Murray State in Arkansas open in the Midwest, and we've just learned that a backup guard, Clint McDaniel, who averaged 4.2 points per season, has been suspended for rules violations, and we'll be covering that story uh, all afternoon. Our doubleheader games will tip at approximately 2.40 Eastern time. Most of you will see South Florida take on Georgetown, and tonight we have another doubleheader headed your way. Our primetime coverage in primetime features Brigham Young and Louisiana State at 8 o'clock Eastern time. But right now, we're going to start everybody out with Miami of Ohio and North Carolina, those of you scheduled to see LaSalle and Seton Hall will get you there for a 12:25 tip. And in areas where Murray State and Arkansas will be seen, we promise to deliver you to Milwaukee by 12:35, the tip time there. Mike and I will see you all afternoon. Right now, the road to the Final Four begins for real here on CBS. Enjoy the day. CBS Sports exclusive coverage of the first round of the NCAA Basketball Championship is sponsored by Baby Ruth. I'd do anything for my baby, Baby Ruth. State Farm Insurance, like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. And by Budweiser, the king of beers, who reminds you, friends know when to say when. Coliseum by the banks of the Ohio in downtown Cincinnati. A first round Southeast regional game, Miami of Ohio against the four seated North Carolina Tar Heels. Tonight, top seated Ohio State takes on Mississippi Valley State, followed by Nebraska and Connecticut. Our second game here, Alabama against Stanford. But we begin with four seated North Carolina against 13 seated Miami of Ohio. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Vern Lundquist, along with Len Elmore. North Carolina comes in with its proud tradition, 18 consecutive years in the tournament, 21-9, and nine, Len, this year, but they're slumping a little bit. Well, certainly, Vern, in the last nine games, they've lost six of them, and they've given up an average of 86 points. Now, that's not a winning combination there for Carolina. They're big. They've got three seven-footers on their roster. They're going to have to utilize that size the way they have in the beginning of the year if they're going to be successful in this tournament. North Carolina in the Final Four last year for Miami of Ohio under second-year head coach Joby Wright. They have not made the tournament since 1986, but they come in as the MAC champions, and they have won nine in a row. Well, they're certainly a good team, a better team than a lot of people thought. They weren't expected to win the uh, Mid-America Conference, but I'll tell you, one of the things Joe B. Wright told us is that his team has to play the North Carolina team that's on the floor right now. They can't be intimidated by that aura, which includes the Michael Jordans and the James Worthies. Don't look at the name on the uniform, just look at the player's face. Here are the starting lineups. Craig Michaels, Matt Kramer, John McKenna, Scott Ballou, and Jamie Mercurio for 
Miami of Ohio. George Lynch, Henrik Rodel will start for Brian Reese for the Tar Heels. Eric Montross at center. Hubert Davis, who has been on a sensational streak in the last eight games, and Derek Phelps are in the backcourt. There's Hubert Davis, the 30-point average over the last eight games. The officials for this first game in Cincinnati, David Hall from Lakewood, Colorado, Tom Lopes from Hazlitt, New Jersey, and Rich San Filippo from Milburn, New Jersey. These two teams have met three times, all in the early 70s. North Carolina has won two, Miami of Ohio won. McKenna and Montrose, and North Carolina controls. Derek Phelps has it in the backcourt, number 14. Picked up immediately by Scott Ballou. Henry Grodel, entry pass to Montrose. The double down, and Montrose hits the two. It's important that Carolina gets their big people started early. They've been to 11 straight final 16 appearances in the NCAA tournament, and the way this team is going to get there is to get their big people involved. Miami of Ohio, a much smaller team than is North Carolina, but they do have outstanding perimeter shooters. There's Craig Michaels, number 22. McKenna, who has not played well of late. From the corner, that's the three. But they will kill you from the perimeter. Toby Wright told us that that's going to be the focus. That's what's gotten them to this point by being a very accurate three-point shooting team. Now Phelps to Rodel and back to Lynch. Matt Kramer drops off Lynch. Turn around, no good. And Ballou with a rebound for Miami of Ohio. They lead it 3-2. Four perimeter shooters on this Miami, Miami team. None of the starting... ...seeded Seton Hall Pirates beat the 13th seed, the LaSalle Explorers. Later tonight, the nation's top-ranked team of the defending NCAA champion, the Duke Blue Devils, will meet Campbell University. But up now, it's Seton Hall and LaSalle. And hello, everybody. I'm Mel Proctor, along with Dan Bonner, and we're looking forward to seeing the LaSalle Explorers. Dan, who put up over 800 three-pointers as a team. They feature one of the leading three-point marksmen in the country in Randy Woods. Now, in fact, they take 42% of their shots from beyond the three-point line, and this guy is the major one by himself he's taken almost as many threes as the entire seat and all team and obviously when you take that many you're going to make a lot of them and you can see what randy woods has done with his scoring this year, a tremendous scoring machine. The Seton Hall Pirates have several big names like Terry DeHare and Jerry Walker, but I know you feel maybe the key is the defensive stopper Gordon Winchester. A 6'7 senior, one of the best defensive players in the Big East, and I'll tell you why he's the key. LaSalle's a two-headed monster. There's Randy Woods and Jack Hurd. He's going to have to guard Jack Hurd. And let's take a look at the starting lineups for today's game. The keys, as Dan mentioned, Randy Woods and Jack Hurd, the three-point specialist. Seton Hall with an outstanding backcourt, Brian Caver and Terry DeHair. The officials, Jim Stupin from Cypress, California, Bill Kennedy from Phoenix, Arizona, and Paul Castor from Omaha, Nebraska. There's Jerry Walker, the strong inside player. It does a lot of the dirty work, sets picks, rebounds, grabs loose balls, really a key to Seton Hall's success. Milko Leverst of LaSalle jumping against Arturis Kranichevis of Seton Hall. Jack Hurd is up with it into Randy Woods and a quick LaSalle basket. LaSalle sets up in his own defense, Dan. LaSalle plays an awful lot of zone, a 2-3 matchup. DeHare misses a three-pointer. LaSalle would like to get it up and down a little bit. Seton Hall extremely strong in the half-court defensively. Seton Hall playing a man-to-man. -man. You see Woods' quickness, but a fine block by Brian Caver, and it's out of bounds to the Explorers. Caver has the task of chasing Randy Woods around the floor today. And he's going to have to chase him around, too, because LaSalle runs plays to get the three-point shots. They're not a three-point shooting team off transition, necessarily, so Caver's going to get bounced around. Here comes Woods, and here comes the three. DeHair runs it down. That is blindsided. And a foul against Jeff Neubauer of LaSalle. He is starting in place of Paul Burke, who is normally the starting point guard, but he underwent an appendectomy just two weeks ago. He is in uniform and probably will play, but Neubauer started 
in the conference tournament. Look for Seton Hall to try to get the ball inside against the zone. The way you have to attack this zone, Mel, is you've got to get the ball inside, either with the dribble or the pass, and then operate inside or kick it back out. DeHair dishes to Karnishevis for a three. Bigger than the side. DeHair with a tough shot, but he got fouled. The Explorers bailing him out with a foul. And I think your statement about a tough shot, Mel, is correct. When they have been able to get the ball close to the basket, it's been tough shots. Foul is on Braun Holland. That's his second. It reminds me a little bit of Ed Neely, who played at Kansas State in the NBA. Wow, he's, he's so big, he reminds you of any two guys you can think of standing together. Terry DeHair now with seven points. He's made just three of eight field goal attempts. That is 0 for 4 from three-point range. First team all Big East collection for the second straight year. Out of St. Anthony's High School in Jersey City. Same school that produced Bobby Hurley and Jerry Walker. And Seton Hall is staying in the game at the free throw line. They've converted all eight of their free throw attempts. Less than a minute remaining in the half. The man open underneath. Burke was open, but Neubauer couldn't get the pass through the traffic. And Seton Hall picks up a foul. It's on Gordon Winchester. Seton Hall is noted for its half-court defense. And P.J. Carlissimo knowing that Speedy Morris is going to try to run time off the clock. Well, P.J. switches his defense to an aggressive trap. Very nearly gets a steal. That's a 16 foul. So on the next foul, a one-on-one -on -one coming up for LaSalle. Looks like they're going to sit on the ball a little bit. Work for the last shot. Jack Hurd has other things in mind, and Winchester fouls him. That's his third foul. And Hurd is going to get to go to the free throw line for three opportunities. It was funny, Mel. You'd think that LaSalle is going to hang on to the basketball, but they sort of therefore have the element of surprise working for them because Hurd pulls up for the shot, and I think Winchester was surprised. They're going for the trap trying to steal it. He comes from behind and picks up the foul. I stand corrected. That's a second foul on Winchester, who will come out now. John Leahy replaces him. But Jack Hurd, a 71% shooter, will shoot three. LaSalle feels as important as Randy Woods is that Hurd is really the key. They think Woods is going to get his 30, but the key is for Hurd to, to get his uniform number, 25. When he normally gets that many points, they win. If Hurd is scoring that many, he's drilling them from 3-2, and LaSalle is awfully tough to beat. However, he misses two of three free throw opportunities. LaSalle leads by two with 29 seconds left, and now Seton Hall can work for the last shot. As poorly as the Pirates have played in this first half, they're very much in the game. They're only down by two. If you just watched the game and didn't watch the scoreboard, you'd think they were behind by 10 or 15 points. And that's because they haven't looked very effective on the offensive end of the court, but sometimes a good zone defense like this makes you look bad offensively. That's another wall. Traveling on to Hare, that's the 12th turnover. The Pirates are averaging 16 a game, so uh, they're well ahead of schedule, and that really upsets P.J. Carlissimo. Randy Woods will come back in with LaSalle having the last possession. And this is another gamble. This kid's got three personal fouls. If you pick up the charge or you push off against somebody, that could really hurt. Three-pointer by Newbauer. That counts a buzzer beater by Jeff Newbauer. His first three points of the game, and LaSalle is up by five at halftime. I'll tell you what, Woods is in the game, so you figure you've got to guard him. You leave Newbauer alone. He's not noted for his three-point shooting ability. That's his first shot attempt of the half. And then that's the end of the first half with a score of LaSalle 36, Seton Hall 31. CBS Sports exclusive coverage of the NCAA Basketball Championship will continue after this message and a word from your local station. CBS Sports exclusive coverage of the first round of the NCAA Basketball Championship is sponsored by Quaker State. The big Q is one tough motor oil. Delta Faucet Company, Delta, the way water is brought to light. And by Michelin, because so much is riding on your tires. 
It's halftime. LaSalle and Seton Hall, 36 to 31. The Pirates of Seton Hall are down by five. And hi again, everybody. Pat O'Brien and Mike Francesa uh, here in our New York studios. And Speedy Morris may have bought a new shirt for this tournament. <laughs> he also has prepared his team well, or is he lucky? Surprise, surprise. No, they're not lucky. I mean, they run into uh, Seton Hall has run into a red hot guy in Randy Woods. 21 first half points, and Seton Hall has to do a better job of taking care of the basketball, Pat. 12 first half turnovers and utilize their advantage inside. If they can't do that, this is going to go right to the wire. And you know, you think in these first round games, a favored team like Seton Hall uh, should be able to take command or think they're able to take command. What does that do to them, to them at halftime now, down by five? As we talked about in the open, Pat, playing in the first half of opening games, I don't care who the opponent is, is very tough. To find your rhythm, you've been off a couple of days, always anxiety in the tournament and it's tough even for highly seeded teams and that's why you have to get through that first one you get that one hot player let's yep. uh, bring people up to date on what's going to happen this afternoon in our game twos this afternoon south florida and georgetown about 2:45 eastern time don't uh, keep us to these times that's about it west virginia and missouri anthony peeler a big time player anthony peeler is a huge missouri. player he can do what woods is doing for uh, lasalle right now pat he is an enormously talented player stanford alabama pepperdine memphis state byu and lsu it's eight o'clock tonight and uh, folks will get a chance to uh, see uh, Shaquille O'Neal as a big-time player. And if they haven't seen him, this is the next great NBA center, whether he comes out this year or next year. Seven foot, 300 pounds, can do everything on the floor, but BYU will not be easy. They're deep. They have seven players over 6'8". They have a lot of fouls to give. They'll be ready to play. We're going to send everybody for a taste out in the southeast. Uh, Cincinnati, Miami of Ohio, and North Carolina. Carolina 36 to 29 is the score. Vern Lundquist and Len Elmore. Gentlemen. Welcome those of you who've been watching other NCAA tournament action here at Cincinnati at 36-31, North Carolina with a five-point edge early in the second half from the corner, Mercurio! That is the seventh three-pointer for Miami of Ohio. And this has been a game where North Carolina has been able to utilize their inside advantage, getting Eric Montross the ball when he needs it, but Miami of Ohio refuses to quit. They get outside shots and they've been putting them down after a cold first uh, half. Miami of Ohio has had only one lead. That was at 3-2 in the opening minute of play. But they have been tied twice. They trail now by two. Underneath, Derek Phelps. Montrose, strong rebound. Davis. As he fall, Lamar Williams has been a force for Miami of Ohio. Gets the rebound. Number 50, Lamar Williams, who prior to today had played in only 14 ball games. But Joby Wright went to him early when McKenna couldn't handle Montross. And Lamar Williams has done it on both ends of the board, particularly offensive rebounding. 36-34, Miami of Ohio from Oxford. Just 35 miles away from Cincinnati. Here's Mercurio. And the trade dishes back. Offensive foul, Mercurio. Southeast region in Cincinnati. Four games later tonight. The top seed, the Buckeyes, take on Mississippi Valley State. Nebraska, Connecticut could be a real close ball game. Alabama, Stanford, our next game here at Contrast and Styles. And in the first of four games, North Carolina, the fourth seed. 11 consecutive times in the Sweet 16. They were in the final four a year ago. Miami of Ohio has not won an NCAA basketball game since 1978. There's the double down on Montross, leaving Phelps open, and the shot won't fall. And so uh, Miami of Ohio hanging in there, down by two against the Tar Heels of North Carolina, and Mike Francesa, Joby Wright, did a good job of convincing his players that he's playing the 1992 North Carolina team, not Jordan and Perkins and Worthy and those Not guys. some of the great teams, but they have to keep launching those threes. The three-pointers are keeping Miami of Ohio in the game. North Carolina has a big advantage inside, but look what you're seeing so far. Seton Hall losing. Carolina in a struggle, and Arkansas having all kinds of problems with Murray State. Welcome to the NCAA tournament. Miami just pulled ahead by one, 37 to 36. What we're seeing is good games in this first round. We've got another good one now four-point game going out in the Midwest in Milwaukee. Dick Stockton and Greg Kelser are men there for Murray State and Arkansas. Arkansas up by four. A lot closer than people anticipated. The Arkansas Razorbacks leading Murray State by four points with two and a half minutes remaining in the first half. Murray State actually had the lead at 36 to 35 moments ago. Remock misses for Arkansas in the white. Todd Dave inside to Wallace, and they're going to call 
The foul against Arkansas. Arkansas just appears to be pressing a little bit here. They've had some foul trouble with Day in the game with two. Miller has two. They're just trying to stay above board right now. Playing without anything to lose, playing very comfortable Murray State, and they've had excellent balance offensively, both inside and on the perimeter. Popeye Jones, all 270 pounds of him, has scored 11 points and has seven rebounds, and he's been the feature for this club. There he is on the perimeter right now. Murray State with the ball in Allen's hands. Allen, he can create offense for himself, has already knocked down two three-pointers in this game. There's the shot clock. There's Popeye, who's shown he can handle the ball, pass it nifty, and power in. Allen working against Remack in a three-point shot. And there's Popeye Jones with the follow-up. He'll get another chance at it. It's slapped away, and a good defensive play by Wallace to the Razorback. And so Murray State hanging in there, as Dick Stockton said, a lot closer than a lot of people would have thought going into this. And I think if you know in Richardson, you get in there at halftime and you say, hey, guys, remember, this is the NCAA tournament. This is it. Let's go out and play, for, play hard. I don't think they've played very hard the first 15 minutes of Murray this Murray State were the giant killers, what, 80, 88, 88 beat NC State. And Jim Belvano. Can they be good? another giant killer? It's a little early there. It's a little early for that. A little early right. for that in this game. A lot of people are sweating these things out here in the brackets with these close games, but we love it here. The road to the Final Four continues on CBS after this. Stay with us. Left in the ball game, there's a story unfolding in Cincinnati. Dean Smith, this is his 22nd tournament, and he finds himself up only by one in the first round against Miami of Ohio. Mike Francesa and I here are watching this with bated breaths, really. Pat, North Carolina has been to the Sweet 16 11 years in a row, and this is very atypical of a Carolina team. In the last minute 10, the lead has dwindled from six points to one. They have turned the ball over two different times in the minute 10, and really for Carolina, they are very much rattled, and this does not look like a Dean Smith team. Miami of Ohio has had 11 three-pointers in this game. Mercurio has had eight, and they have really lived on the perimeter and shown a lot of spunk, and right now, with 32 seconds left, they may be getting ready to spring an upset. 32 seconds left, a one-point game. North Carolina up by one against Miami of Ohio. Ohio. The crowd will be with Miami here. They're 35 miles from their campus out in Cincinnati, and here's Vernon Lamb. Welcome, those of you who have been watching other NCAA games. 32.4 seconds remaining. Miami of Ohio down by one. Here's John McKenna. Stolen away. McKenna, the sophomore, tries to find David Scott. Now, Miami of Ohio has got the shot. And they are out of timeouts. Back to Davis. Foul by Bowie. And Davis is perfect for the day from the line. He's been abysmal from the field. In the first half, we made the point that being successful in the NCAA tournament means you have to be aggressive and strong with the ball. Carolina with great denied defense for some people that Miami really wasn't uh, comfortable with in getting the ball. And Hubert Davis goes to the line. You know, a guy like McKenna is not accustomed to having the ball in a tight game situation. Didn't hold the ball strongly, didn't wait until someone was clearly open. McKenna, who had been benched for much of the game in favor of Lamar Williams, and that may have cost Miami of Ohio the season. They trail by three. Mercurio has hit eight today. They're out of timeouts, trying to free up the three-point shot. Oh, wow! So North Carolina up by three safely, I think we can say, with two seconds left in the game. Uh, Seton Hall is now up by two, as you've been looking at on your screen. A minute 12 left in this ball game. Close games all over, folks. Here's Mel Proctor and Dan Bonner at courtside there. Mel Proctor with Dan Bonner. Greensboro, North Carolina, with a minute left in the game. Seton Hall leads by two. LaSalle has led for most of the game and led by as many as nine points. It's been just within the last minute 
The Seahawks taking the lead. Jack Hurd scores, and the score is tied at 76. Well, Seton Hall has made nine of its last 11 shots. The Pirates have struggled offensively the entire game, but in the stretch, they've gotten hot when they desperately needed to do so. This is perhaps when that tournament experience comes into play, and Seton Hall was in the tournament last year. Only about a couple of tenths of a second difference between shot clock and game clock. Final seconds, Seton Hall working for what they hope will be the game winner. Terry DeHarris had a good second half. Sometimes it's not the shot, it's the rebound, Mel. DeHarris! Yeah. A two-pointer by DeHarris, giving Seton Hall the lead with 1.8 seconds left. And LaSalle is taking a timeout. Been a struggle for Seton Hall. They've been behind most of the game, but DeHare gives them the lead. And this now makes 10 of 12 that Seton Hall has hit. DeHare gets around the screen under good pressure. What a great screen by Winchester. He got two guys and nailed them. Burke could not get out, and DeHare drills it. Situation: 1.8 seconds left in the game. Terry DeHair's basket has given Seton Hall a two-point lead, 78-76. I'm Mel Proctor, along with Dan Bonner, as we bring you first-round action in the East Region. Seton Hall likes not to call the timeout, but runs the clock down. There's Terry DeHair in the corner, goes off a great screen by Winchester, and just buries it. Paul Burke, number 23, gets caught on the Winchester screen. Wooten cannot switch out quickly enough. Agrees. Terry DeHare, who's had a 16-point second half, has given Seton Hall the lead. And now with just 1.8 seconds left, Speedy Morris is out of timeouts. What can LaSalle do? Well, one of the things that LaSalle can do, we saw in last year's NCAA tournament first round, Princeton and Villanova in a situation very much like this. And what Princeton did was try to hold the ball out so that the Villanova guy would touch it and get a technical foul. So if you're Seton Hall, and LaSalle's taking it out of bounds underneath the basket, and the guy holds the ball out to you. You've got to leave that alone. You don't want to slap at it. A technical foul, of course, would give LaSalle a chance to tie. What you want to do is make sure that if somebody catches the basketball, they catch it in front of you for Speedy Morris. Get it across half court with the pass if you can and hope that they can get the shot up. And the winner of this game will meet the winner of the Missouri-West Virginia game coming up. Later tonight will be Texas against Iowa. That promises to be a good one. And the top seed, Duke, will beat Campbell. All from Greensboro. This has been a tremendous basketball game, one in which Seton Hall has trailed throughout. Seton Hall will call a timeout. LaSalle led by the outside shooting of Randy Woods has led for most of the game, but Terry DeHare has given Seton Hall a two-point lead with 1.8 seconds left. Paul Burke will inbound for LaSalle. Fakes the long pass, winds up, fires it long. Batted away and picked off by DeHare. And Seton Hall has come from behind to win it. A heartbreaker for LaSalle. The Explorers led for most of the game. But Seton Hall outscored the Explorers 16 to 6 over the last four minutes to win it. Seton Hall, Mel, only turned the ball over two times. All right, uh, out of Milwaukee in the Midwest, uh, Arkansas has gotten its act together, 78 to 69. Now, 24 seconds left. Let's go out to Dick Stockton and Greg Kelson. Have scares before prevailing. Frank Allen will leave the game. Frank Allen lit it up for Murray State today with 25 points, 18 of them in the second half, but in a losing cause. As he gets a hand from the crowd here at the Bradley Center, Dick Stockton and Greg Kelser in the final seconds of the first round matchup as Arkansas will advance against Murray State. And Murray State played a terrific game and in a sense could have won this game. No question about it. The score, not at all indicative 
of the type of game this was. Murray State put a scare into Arkansas. We're right there. And I think when the game is over, they'll look back at the missed layup, the missed free throws, and say, wow, and think what could have been. Popeye Jones did not disappoint a soul today. Jones with 17 points and 15 rebounds. A great job. So with Arkansas advancing in less than a half a minute, they'll play the winner of Memphis State and Pepperdine coming up next. And of course tonight, Georgia Tech against Houston and Southern Cal, the number two seed, against Northeast Louisiana. But you're right, it was a lot closer than the 11 points showing on the board right now. Civils misses, and Arkansas can use up the clock. Arkansas, plenty of reason to be pleased and optimistic. They won today, and Todd Day did not have a Todd Day type day. Foul trouble, and nine points is all Todd Day got. Lynn misses the three, and the game is over. Oliver Miller really did it for Arkansas today. The game is over. Murray State, 80 to 69. To advance to the second round here in the Midwest region, here in Milwaukee. Razorbacks now 26 and 7. And 80 to 69. Pat O'Brien and Mike Francesa will join you when we come back in just a moment. Has that story for us. He's probably uh, one of the all-time great players to ever play uh, college basketball. And from what I can see, he's probably going to be one of the all-time great players to ever play in the NBA. The volumes of praise for Shaquille O'Neal are matched only by the number of questions regarding his future. Will Shaq be back or will he be packed and gone to the NBA next year? As the speculation mounts, once again, O'Neal is living out his own private version of March Madness. I'm probably asked the question a uh, hundred times a day, and I just tell everybody the same thing. Uh, right now, I don't know. Decision 92 intensified last week after a foul on O'Neal sparked a bench-clearing brawl in an SEC tournament game. The scales may be tipping in favor of the NBA. There's a feeling if he's going to get pounded, he might as well get paid. I will not stand by idly and see him beaten to death. I don't care if he is 300 pounds. He's a human being. And I thought he would but grossly mishandle the fact that Shaquille O'Neal, who's been unbelievable, turned down $30 million to come back. It broke my heart to watch him leave that court for protection with three policemen in Birmingham, Alabama. An injustice was done. One thing is certain, the O'Neal appeal is not going away. Thousands showed up just to watch a tournament practice yesterday. Sooner or later, in the NBA, millions will come. Dollars, that is. I'm just going to stick to that saying. Uh, you can't miss nothing that you never had. And uh, at the end of the season, uh, I'm going to do what's best for me. So when do you suspect that you'll make your decision once the... I don't know. One day. <laughs> A story I'm sure we're going to be reporting on for some time. Do you think he's... Welcome to Boise, Idaho, where today the West Regional gets underway. In the first of four games here, the six-seeded Georgetown Hoyas take on the South Florida Bulls, the 11 seed. Boise is the site of great big men, including the two best in college basketball today in Shaquille O'Neal and Alonzo Mourning. It's also the home of legendary coaches in Bobby Knight, John Thompson, and Dale Brown. Later today, Florida State takes on Montana. LSU battles BYU, and Indiana will play Eastern Illinois. If you're just joining us, the action is already underway in the other three regionals in the southeast at Cincinnati. North Carolina survived a scare from Miami of Ohio, the final 68-63. It was a tournament record 48th win for Dean Smith. In the east at Greensboro, LaSalle missed a three-point shot in the final seconds, and Seton Hall prevailed 78-76. And in the Midwest at Milwaukee, Arkansas beat Murray State 80-69 despite only nine points from Todd Day, who was in foul trouble through most of the game. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Boise. I'm Sean McDonough. It's nice to have you with us. 
As is so often the case in the first round of the tournament, we have teams with contrasting histories. For South Florida, this is just their second trip to the tournament. They were here in 1990. For Georgetown, 14 straight appearances in the tournament under John Thompson. He says the NCAA tournament never gets old. No, I, I think uh, playing in this tournament is always a lot of excitement for everybody because this is what you aim towards. You really aim towards uh, getting in an opportunity to compete for the national championship. And if it gets to a point that it's boring, you need to get the heck out of it because it, it definitely causes the adrenaline to flow uh, a lot more than it does in the regular season. I mentioned this is the regional of great big men, and who better to talk about it than perhaps the best big man in the history of college basketball, Bill Walton, the three-time player of the year at UCLA and a member of two national championship teams. Bill, is Alonzo Mourning the kind of player who can carry Georgetown through this tournament? He definitely is, Sean. Alonzo Mourning is a very big and powerful man. He'll do everything required of his team to get them as far as they can. He's the type of player that can get it done in a lot of different ways. He'll block shots, he'll score, he'll play the great defense. But as always in any Georgetown game, when you look back at the history of this great basketball school, it's going to be outside shooting that's the real key for them. Morning will get his job done, but the South Florida defense will try to neutralize him. The other guys on the perimeter, they'll have to fill it up from outside. Well, Georgetown's best player is their big man in morning. The best player for the South Florida Bulls is their point guard, the Yugoslavian, Radenko Dobras. Dobras is an outstanding basketball player, does everything. He has the ball all game long. He's a guy who really can do everything with the basketball, handles it both right and left. He'll be dribbling all over the basketball court trying to create for themselves. He's the type of guy that can get it done from the perimeter driving to the hoop. But in this game, Georgetown, one of the best defensive teams in the history of college basketball, they're going to try to take the ball away from Dobras. The other guys are going to have to step up and get the job done. It's South Florida out of the Metro with a record of 19-9 against Georgetown out of the Big East at 21-9. Well, the starting lineups and the opening tip after this. CBS Sports exclusive coverage of the first round of the NCAA Basketball Championship is sponsored by Baby Ruth. I'd do anything for my baby, Baby Ruth. State Farm Insurance, like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. And by Budweiser, the king of beers, who reminds you, friends know when to say when. Lacey, it's South Florida against Georgetown. Now let's go to our PA announcer, K.J. Mack, for the introduction of today's starting lineups. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Boise State University Pavilion for today's NCAA game between South Florida Bulls and the Georgetown Hoyas. And now let's meet the starting lineups for South Florida. At forward, a 6'5 senior from Fort Lauderdale, Florida, number 32, Bobby Russell. For Georgetown, at forward, a 6'6 sophomore from Silver Springs, Maryland, number 22, Robert Churchwell. For South Florida, at forward, a 6'7 senior from Tampa, Florida, number 5, Fred Lewis. For Georgetown, at forward, a 6'6 senior from Cincinnati, Ohio, number 40, Brian Kelly. For South Florida, at center, a 6'7 senior from Jacksonville, Florida, number 21, Gary Alexander. For Georgetown, at center, a 6'10 senior from Chesapeake, Virginia, number 33, Alonzo Mourning. For South Florida, guard, a 6'7 senior from Banja Luka, Yugoslavia, number 31, Radenko Dobras. For Georgetown, at guard, a 5'10 sophomore from Morgan, Louisiana, number 10, Joey Brown. For South Florida, guard, a 6'1 junior from Orlando, Florida, number 24, Derek Sharp. And at guard for Georgetown, a 6'1 freshman from Riverdale, Maryland, number 11, Urban Church. And the coaches for South Florida in his fifth season, Bobby Pascoe, and for Georgetown in his 20th season, John Thompson. The Boise State Pavilion.
site of first round action in the West Regional. Georgetown making its 17th appearance, including 14 straight. They won this tournament in 1984. Last year, they lost in the second round to UNLV. Meanwhile, South Florida makes its second appearance. They were last year in 1990 and lost in the first round to Arizona in Long Beach, California, here in the West. The officials, Jim Danner from Balin, New Mexico, Tom Rucker from Bloomfield Hills, Michigan, and Bobby Vetketter from Maybank, Texas. Rodenko Dobros, the key to the South Florida Bulls. When he was healthy this year, they were 17 and three. When he was hobbled for eight games by a ankle sprain, they were two and six. And Alonzo Mourning, happy to be healthy all year, bothered by injuries in past years, but not this season. And he's the Big East Player of the Year. Gary Alexander and Alonzo Mourning tip it, controlled by the South Florida Bulls in the green. Quick leaping ability by Alexander. Stole the tap from Morning. This is Fred Lewis, number five. And now Alexander. Shot off by Morning. Dobras, short from two-point range. Alexander, the offensive rebound. Quick shot by Derek Sharp. And an air ball from three-point range. Then Bobby Russell steps on the baseline. It will be Georgetown ball. Good opportunity for Sharp to reset that ball. Whenever you get an offensive rebound, it's always nice when you want to control the tempo, as USF South Florida wants to do. They've got to bring that ball out, get a new offensive rhythm going. South Florida, throughout the year, predominantly a man-to-man -man team, but against Alonzo Morning. Dobras lobbed it into Alexander, trying to shed Morning. It was slapped away by Church to Joey Brown. Excellent team defense by Georgetown. <laughs> Alexander got a hand of the pass. Churchwell trying to skip it across to Church. Interesting that we get a substitution on the first dead ball of the game. Second dead ball, there was the baseline violation for South Florida. Derek Sharp went to the bench, replaced by number 10, Gerard Arseman. Shot long by Church, rebounded by Arseman. Maybe Bobby Pascal didn't like that quick three-pointer that Sharp took. Lewis. Scores the first points of the game for South Florida. It's 3-2 Georgetown. We played just more than a minute and a half. Lewis is the emotional and physical team leader of this South Florida Bulls. Ryan Kelly, another who plays with a lot of emotion, the running hook. You're around the country and first out to Cincinnati were Stanford and Alabama. Alabama and White and uh, Plaid with their coach. They lead 33 to 27, 320 in the first half, Mike. Big key there, Pat. Stanford having all kinds of problems handling Alabama's quickness. They're a very athletic team. Stanford can get the ball down low to Adam Keith. When they do that, they're in good shape. He has 12 first half points. But again, just the overall quickness of Alabama, a little too much for the Cardinals. Stuck in a timeout there. Let's go over to Greensboro and see if we have any luck there. West Virginia and Missouri. It's a one-point game, 21 to 20. West Virginia up. Jerry West would be proud of them, huh? And really, they are a scrappy team, the Mountaineers. They're young. They like to run up and down the floor. They'll stay in the game, as I said before. Missouri trying to overcome the obstacle of being a team that always has problems in the opening round. They've come in having lost four straight. So they right now are really in a tenuous situation, and this Mountaineer team is very, very dangerous. Out of the Midwest in Milwaukee, Pepperdine and Memphis State, they're battling it out. Memphis State up by five with 9.05 in the first half. You know, Memphis State got out very quickly in this game to a seven-zip lead, 13-5. Christie was carrying Pepperdine early, but now the waves have started to settle into the game. They're back in the flow, a little more comfortable. Need to step it up and give Christie a little help. But they really have overcome that first op obstacle. They're very comfortable in the game right now. Memphis State up by five in that game. And it looks to me like Georgetown, when they get out of the Big East, they have a little more fun. They're running and gunning. Already 34 points. That's more than they usually get in a half in the Big East. And seven of eight from three. So the Hoyas right now lighting it up. And they are going up and down the court. Back out to the city of trees. Sean McDonough and Bill Walton. Very impressive, Patrick, the city of trees, the city of 128,000 people, Boise, Idaho. A great point, I think, that they made about Georgetown. 
it is not a Big East style game to this point, and they are faring very well. Not that physical, and the other team, South Florida, willing to cast off from distance as Derek Sharp continues to use questionable judgment on his selection. I'm looking forward to if Pepperdine can hold on to that victory over Memphis State. The Pepperdine Arkansas matchup, Doug Christie versus Todd Day. It's 31 25, Memphis State. Dick Stockton and Greg Kelser are courtside. 308 left in the first half. Here at the Bradley Center in Milwaukee, Pepperdine with the ball, the trailing Memphis State. And Fernay Hardaway, one of the great all-around players in basketball, with the ball now, he has nine points. But Doug Christie has 14 of Pepperdine's 25. We have 2.45 remaining in the first half. Dick Stockton and Greg Kelser here in Milwaukee. Christie has had to be more assertive, therefore he has 14 points. But it's been more of a team effort for Memphis State Hardaway with only nine, but not trying to do too much. Tipping it in is Hardaway. He's got 11 points. The only player in the country in Division I that ranks in the top five in his conference. Points, rebounds, assists, steals, and block shots. Guile misses a three-point attempt. Pepperdine has to make sure they get good shot opportunities because Memphis State so tough on the glass is limiting them to one shot. Vaughn misses the turnaround, but it's tapped out again. They can't get the defensive board. Madlock misses. And this one will be Pepperdine's ball. Our first half story, Pepperdine. And it'll be a big conversation piece at halftime. How to block out how to keep Memphis State off the glass. Memphis State not shooting a high percentage, but getting second and third opportunities. Saw so Derek Noether come into the game for the Waves. Jeff Lear hasn't done much. He has not scored. Came in averaging 17 points a game, and the Waves have sorely missed his scoring ability. Memphis State is on an 11-3 run right now. Pepperdine barely missed a 10-second violation crossing half court that time. Christie fails on a three, and Anthony Douglas clears the rebound. Memphis State has its biggest lead right now of 11 points. And there's that man again, Billy Smith. That's his third three-point basket of the game. He has 15 points. He is the overall high scorer now. Well, if you're Pepper Down and you're going to play a zone, you've got to realize who's on the perimeter that can hurt you. Guile comes back and matches it with a three. That's his second from three-point lane. And the same thing can be said for Memphis State. Guile has to be guarded. A standstill perimeter shooter who can be very effective without a hand in his face. And Smith has already indicated to Pepper Down that he's going to be prolific from the three-point area. He's knocked down three trays already. They got 27 seconds on the shot clock. Billy Smith has scored 12 of Memphis State's last 14 points. The Waves will get the ball back. Shot clock, 10 seconds. And they loop it in to Vaughn. And they'll call the foul. It'll be a Pepperdine foul, and it'll be guiled. First foul on Guiled, who has nine points off the bench for the Waves. Kelvin Allen has come in along with Ernest Smith, number 23. Allen, 31 for Memphis State. 15 foul against Pepperdine, and Vaughn will go to the line to shoot, and an outstanding free throw shooter is Vaughn. He has made 16 in a row coming into this game. Memphis State getting Hardaway out of there before he can pick up the third. Marcus Nolan, a 6'2 freshman from Memphis, will report replacing Billy Smith, who goes out with 15 points and three three-point baskets to spark the Tigers. And not that uh, Pepperdine didn't come in on a roll. 17 out of 18, they won their last. 
They did, Pat, and they dominated their conference, but they were 0-4 against the field of teams that got into this tournament. So they had to prove that they could step up to this level, and they really have had problems handling Memphis State on the backboards. Let's bring you all up to date. In the southeast region earlier, North Carolina over Miami of Ohio, 68-63. to Montrose with 22. In the southeast region, Stanford and Alabama underway right now, 35-31. to They are at half at halftime. Seton Hall uh, escaped a big scare from the south, 78-76. to uh, Terry DeHair had 24 points. In the East Region, West Virginia and Missouri underway now, 35 to 32. Uh, the lights went out just a few minutes ago out there. We're not quite sure why, but we know they have them back on, so this game will go on. And uh, there you see a live picture of their scoreboard there, which is about the brightest thing in the building right now. 35 to 32 with 327 left. As you can see, what happens when lights go out in arenas that are new, uh, it takes them a few minutes to get them back on, but they'll get them on and the game will be played 35 to 32. Uh, Murray State and Arkansas. Arkansas had no problems at the end anyway, winning this one 80 to 69. And the road to the Final Four will continue after this. Stay with us. Hope you're having a good day. She's of you who've been watching other NCAA tournament action, we have five, 53 seconds remaining. And Alabama's will throw three well at the line with the second of a one and one. This would give favored Alabama a six-point edge. Now that they've stepped up to the lead, Alabama offensively has decided to go to half-court, spread the floor, and try to draw some fouls. Defensively, they just want to cover shooters with this pressure. This isn't designed to steal the ball. This is to make sure that they don't get wide-open jump shots. Marcus Lawley gets it off to Garrett, and the foul is called on Washington. Mike Montgomery's team trying to come from behind. They're down by six. The winner of this game gets North Carolina on Saturday. North Carolina, a five-point victory over Miami of Ohio. And later tonight, Ohio State takes on Mississippi Valley State. And then the final game here in Cincinnati, Nebraska, and the University of Connecticut. Pretty good foul by Washington as Lally tried to penetrate to the basket. Since Alabama's not in the penalty right now, they can afford it. 38 seconds to go. Lolly off balance shot. And a loose ball. Out of bounds. Who's it? Stanford's. Well, the one thing Alabama doesn't want to do is foul. And they certainly want to protect from the three-point area with 32.7 seconds left. Stanford trying to win its first NCAA game in 50 years. Since they won the NCAA title in 1942, Adam Keith, the second team All-American. That's the foul of Robert Corey, and again, they're still not in the shooting situation. Foul to give with 30 seconds remaining. But you don't want to stop the clock unless the guy's going for a layup. Dukes, good defense. Latrell Sprewell was right in his face. Tell you, Sprewell is such a great defender. During the, the course of this season, he's had to play Bryant Stiff, Tom Bugliata, Alan Houston, and, and John Pelfrey from the various tough teams of great scorers, and he's done a job on them. Lolly with a foul on Elliott Washington. That's his fifth. So Marcus Lolly is going to have to leave the game. The junior from Seattle with no points at the half, but 14 in the second half, and his effort really kept Stanford in the uh, thick of things. But when Adam Keith got his third foul, and he started to play at the high post because Stanford couldn't afford to have him down low and pick up another, he wasn't involved in the offense, and it was Lolly who picked it up. Marcus Lolly fouls out 14 points, six above his season per game average. And Kenny Hicks takes his place. 16 seconds remaining. Alabama hoping to get into the Sweet 16 again this year. They'd have to get by North Carolina to accomplish that. But they're only 16 seconds away from getting that shot at North Carolina on Saturday. Washington. And the lead is seven. I think this was a good win for Alabama for obvious reasons, but more importantly, they recognize they can play different types of basketball. You know, they got to play a, a slower tempo than maybe they wanted to, but yet they use their defense primarily to win this basketball game. And you bet uh, we'll come back if they score eight points in ten seconds there. And so back to Boise we go. South Florida and Georgetown, a six-point game. 
two minutes left uh, in this ball game. Georgetown seems to be back in control. Sean McDonough and Bill Walton are on by Morning, with one second left on the shot clock, scores for Georgetown, and the Hoyas back up by eight with a minute 40 to go in first round action here in Boise. The Hoyas dressed in gray. Sean McDonough along with Bill Walton. South Florida has been as close as three here in the second half. They trailed by nine at halftime as Georgetown got off to that lead because of excellent three-point shooting, but it's been much more of a half-court game here in the second half. Georgetown has got very conservative in the second half, and that was a perfect example. As Joey Brown comes down two-on-one, you've got the big man, take it to the hoop, throw it in the air, and have Alonzo Mourning dunk it. But South Florida's biggest problem has been the inability of the backcourt to fill it up. Dobras has had some good moments. Bobby Pascal there, the fine coach for South Florida. Limited because the bench is so weak there. A couple of guys have been in foul trouble. Fred Lewis, one of their high scores, out with five fouls. Joey Brown made the first. He was 12 assists today, a career high. It was a five-point game when Lewis fouled out. It's now a 10-point lead for Georgetown. With a minute, 22 to play. Be very difficult for South Florida to come back in this situation. Dobras likes to create off the dribble. They're going to be three-point shooting. Sharp. Well off the money. He's two for 11 from the floor. Low as you can be with that jumper. Dobras fouled Kelly. Two fouls on Rodenko Dobras. He's about to see his career in USF end unless they mount the borderline miraculous comeback. Dobras came from Yugoslavia, originally recruited by Larry Brown at Kansas, who saw him play against the international team that Brown coached. As Dobras was ready to go to Kansas. Larry Brown made one of his many moves to the San Antonio Spurs, so Rodenko thought twice about it, and the professor friend of Bobby Pascal suggested that he look into Rodenko Dobras. Rodenko went for the sunshine of the Tampa Bay area. Very good move for Rodenko Dobras, I think. Get to a situation where he can have the ball all the time, get all the shots, and be the star. Georgetown by 10. Brian Kelly makes it 11 with a minute four to play. For those of you just joining us, welcome to Boise. Site of first round action in the West region. Sean McDonough and Bill Walton have a short with the layup. Georgetown ball. Good look at Derek Sharp, who did not have a good basketball game. Georgetown advances to the second round. Georgetown 75 and South Florida 60. The Chevrolet players of the game for South Florida, Rodenko Dobras, and for Georgetown Alonzo Morning. Coming up next here in Boise, Florida State against Montana. Now for Bill Walton, Sean McDonough saying so long from Boise. Let's join Pat O'Brien. All right, Sean, thank you. And, of course, Georgetown will play the winner of Florida State and Montana. We want to send everybody to Milwaukee now. Pepperdine and Memphis State. Pepperdine down by six. A minute 36 left in the game. Dick Stockton and Greg Kelser are there. We're in the final moments of the Midwest region first round battle between Pepperdine and Memphis State. The Tigers led by 13 at the half. Pepperdine stormed back to take a four-point lead, and now with 1.37 to go, Ernest Smith's free throws has given Memphis State a 72-64 lead. Dick Stockton and Greg Kelsey. Big story of this game. Pepperdine struggling early. They got the ball to their man right there, Christie, who helped get them back into it with a calming effect for them. Memphis State got the same thing from their big guy, Hardaway, when uh, Pepperdine threatened to get back into this game. Doug Christie with 20 points, leading Pepperdine, and Anfernee Hardaway has 20 to top Memphis State, the two stars. Jones, who's had a terrific second half, misses Hardaway the rebound. 
and is starting to slip away. And a great second half comeback, maybe for naught for Pepperdine. Well, Memphis State has regained their rebounding dominance for a very long time. They lost that. Pepperdine was able to get back into the game and looked to be the more confident team. Damon Lopez on the foul, so he'll go to the line to shoot two shots now. Earlier, Arkansas defeated Murray State. Now, if Memphis State goes on and holds on to their lead, Arkansas will meet Memphis State Saturday in the second round. Earlier this year, Memphis State shocked Arkansas. That was on February 8th, 92 to 88. So a chance for the Razorbacks to gain a measure of revenge. Larry Finch in his sixth year. He's been to the Final Four as a player. Memphis State terrific from the free throw line. 14 out of 15 as Tony Madlock hits both of them. This game has had it all. We've seen both teams at perhaps their best. We've seen both teams come back. A three-point basket by Damon Lopez. And they're coming back some more, Greg Kelser. And a timeout will return. Once person's new video. 51 seconds remain in the second half. Pepperdine is out of timeouts, and they have the possession hour in their favor in case there's a tie-up. And a quick foul on Anfernee Hardaway will send him to the free throw line. Hardaway coming into the game as a 67% free throw shooter, one for two in this game. That's a good foul by Pepperdine. They've got to really extend this 51, now 48 seconds. And they can do it via the foul. Now, unfortunately for them, they can't discriminate. they got to foul anybody and hope for the missed free throws and be ready to block out. Hardaway has 20 points, 7 assists, and 8 rebounds. One of the greater all-round players in the nation. Gives the Waves a bit of a hope here. Still three possessions down. Pepperdine will have to look for the three. Therefore, Lopez becomes big. Of course, Christie and Guile, who's in the game right now. One out of two for Hardaway. The lead is eight. Lopez with the ball. He's their best three-point shooter. They're not going to give it to him. Christie will take a long one and hit. Christie with a three-point basket. And it's a five-point game. Got a match up now. Get to the basketball. There's the foul. And they foul Tony Madlock who's uh, the best free throw shooter on the team. You can't always pick who you want to foul. I know people say you got to foul this guy and avoid this. You can't always have the choice. Because that's not important now. The important thing is to stop the clock. Badlock, over 80%, four for four today. The 11 points for Madlock. If Madlock makes this, it makes it a three-possession lead for Memphis State. Seven-point game with just under 30 seconds remaining. Can't waste a lot of time. Lopez in and out for the three-point attempt. And Madlock will take his time and hope to be fouled. And he is by Lear. And he can wrap it up if he can make two right now. Alabama defeated Stanford, and they will go on to play North Carolina Saturday afternoon in one of those second-round matchups. Missouri, after trailing West Virginia, now leading early in the second half at Greensboro. And Georgetown finished off South Florida. Tony Madlock, the senior from Memphis, four of the five starters on the Tigers are from Memphis as... Many of the players are on the Arkansas Razorbacks, their next opponent. Good game for Madlock. 13 points, 6 assists. Tip comes right out to Madlock, and he's fouled. So it looks like Memphis State will go to 21-10, and 10, and that will end the season for Pepperdine at 24-7. and 7. They had won 17-18 of 18 coming into this game. And they gave the Tigers a big scare in the second half, Greg. They really did, but I think the telling story was their lack of size inside. They did get aggressive uh, on the glass for a while there, but really not able to maintain it. Memphis State regaining their composure. I think the better team perhaps 
did win this game. And it sets up a, a pretty good matchup in a couple of days, a rematch between Memphis State and Arkansas. Nolan Richardson still on the side. He hasn't left yet. Checking out every little bit of this game. Adlock makes them both 9 of 10 from the line, a 10-point lead. Lopez. Dial the rebound. The time is running out for the Waves of Pepperdine. And that'll do it. Memphis State is advanced. Larry Finch congratulates Tom Asbury. And the Tigers will move on to the second round with a final score of 80 to 70 over Pepperdine. So here in Milwaukee, we have completed the first two games of this Midwest bracket. Memphis State defeating Pepperdine and Arkansas with a victory over Murray State. And two more games coming up tonight in our Chevrolet Players of the Game. Doug Christie for Pepperdine. He scored 23 points and Aperday Hardaway with 21 points, eight assists, and seven rebounds. Greg Kelcher, I enjoyed working with you. The pleasure was all mine, Dick Stockton. You're a top-notch guy as you were when you led Michigan State along with Irvin Johnson to the national title. So the final score here in Milwaukee, the Memphis State Tigers over Pepperdine, 80 to 70. And right now, let's send you back to our New York studios in Pat O'Brien. Pat? All right, Coming up next on CBS Sports, the NCAA Basketball Championship. Well, already eight teams are out, 56 teams still around. And good evening, everyone. I'm Jim Nance, along with Billy Packer. And together, we welcome you to CBS Sports' continuing coverage of the NCAA Basketball Championship. I must, or we must say, the madness has begun. And tonight, it continues across the country. How you doing, Billy? Well, Jim, the, what I got out of this afternoon's ball games, the fact that we didn't have any upsets and, and the fact that the lower-seeded teams didn't come through, but I thought they played extremely well. We're going to see for the first time tonight some of the number one seeds. Maybe we'll have one of those all-time upsets. It doesn't mm. look that way the way they've started, though. It was on this night a year ago when Syracuse was knocked out by Richmond. Uh, let's set tonight's doubleheader lineup for you. Coming up, we'll be sending you out to Boise, Idaho, where Brigham Young meets Louisiana State in West Region first-round action. For the Cougars, Gary Trost has filled in for Sean Bradley, who is on a Mormon mission. Trost leads BYU in both scoring and rebounding. And, of course, he'll try to contain Shaquille O'Neal, who may be the most physically dominating center in college basketball since Patrick Ewing. There are three other games in progress, and we'll be sampling them for you and keeping you current. In fact, let's do that right now. First of all, Ohio State over Mississippi Valley State is now 35 to 11 with 4.50 to go in the first half. Mississippi Valley State, the Delta Devils, had scored the game's first four points. 36 to 11 now. Duke and Campbell, 8.30 to go in the first half. And so far in 11 and a half minutes, the Fighting Camels have managed only nine points. Houston and Georgia Tech, they're about to hold the center jump. That game taking place in Milwaukee. We'll be showing you bits of that at halftime. And Billy, what about Duke? Well, Duke is a team that had some injuries in midseason. And during that uh, stretch of seven games, Jim, they only averaged 73 points a game. Now that they've got everybody back, they're back to those 90-point type games, actually average, averaging 92 over the last five games. And it looks like the score tonight is that type of game that Mike Krzyzewski likes, where they put that pressure defense on and look to run. 
All right, Billy. At about 10 Eastern time, our doubleheader games will begin tipping off. You'll see all or parts of Eastern Illinois and Indiana, Yukon versus Nebraska, Northeast Louisiana and Southern Cal or Iowa against Texas. Now, a couple of late afternoon finals. The three seed in the West, Florida State, a 10-point winner over Montana. But the story there, their starting point guard for the Seminoles, Charlie Ward, dislocated his left shoulder in the second half. X-rays tomorrow morning. His uh, future in this tournament is uncertain at this time. Missouri and West Virginia. Well, Missouri won it by 11. The Tigers, the five seed in the East. But the story there, power outages. Now, for those of you who were watching our coverage earlier in the day, you know that there was some severe weather in the Greensboro, North Carolina area. It disrupted play during that West Virginia-Missouri game. And Leslie Visser was there, and she has more on that story. It's been an explosive day, both in and out of Greensboro Coliseum, as an electrical storm hit the area and knocked the power out here in the arena. This is a News 2 weather bulletin. There have been sightings of funnel clouds and possible tornadoes touching down in these three counties in the southern areas of these counties. Power went out two times for a total of 45 minutes, and with tornadoes in the area, the first concern of committee member Jake Krauthammel was for the safety of the 15,000 fans. I got the building people together and asked, can, can this building withstand a tornado? And uh, are there any uh, emergency procedures as, as far as relocating the spectators in the building? And the answer was, it is uh, safe to be in here, and it's probably safer inside than outside, and in fact, in the seats. Actually, three power outages, three hours and eight minutes to complete that game earlier today. But right now, it's time to send you out for BYU and LSU. Sean McDonough and Bill Walton will have the call from Courtside and Boise when the road to the Final Four continues here on CBS. CBS Sports exclusive coverage of the first round of the NCAA Basketball Championship is sponsored by Reebok, who asks, who is the world's greatest athlete, Van or Dave? Digital equipment. Two games at halftime. LSU BYU, you're watching. Georgia Tech and Houston about a minute from tipping in the second half. Duke all over Campbell. Ohio State easily over Mississippi Valley State. That's the story so far tonight. So we bring you back into the studio first. Jim Nance along with uh, Billy Packer. And Billy, again, the lineup for the back half of our doubleheader. Some will see uh, Indiana against Eastern Illinois. Yukon, Nebraska. Northeast Louisiana against Harold Miner and Southern Cal. And that Iowa-Texas game, the 8-9 game in the East. What catches your eye there, Billy? Well, the emotional status of both Indiana and Connecticut. We've talked about Bob Knight throughout the course of the day in, in regard to how his team is going to respond and not getting that Big Ten championship. And also Connecticut, with Sellers being out, how will his team respond to the young man who will not get an opportunity to play in this first round of the NCAA tournament? Two number one seeds are playing right now. Ohio State, the one seed in the Southeast. Duke, the one seed in the East. But uh, let's check in right now at Cincinnati. Uh, Ohio State, Mississippi, Valley State. Jimmy Jackson at one time in this game was only one out of ten from the floor, Billy. Three for 13 now. They're getting a big game out of Lawrence Funderburk. The key, of course, is, is for your teammates to be able to pick you up. We saw Todd Day did not have a big day today, but he was picked up by his teammates. The same thing is holding true for Ohio State. But as they advance in this tournament, if they are to advance in, for, in future games, Jim Jackson will have to be the All-American player he has proved to be. Come in on 35-year-old coach Randy Ayers. Do you think he learned anything last year losing in the regional semifinals? Now, one thing he learned is that St. John's will fast break against you if you try to go ahead and press them full court. But uh, I think Randy has done a tremendous job. He was an outstanding assistant coach. He really has this program in excellent shape. His recruiting is, is uh, moving along in fine fashion. I see no reason for the Ohio State fans to believe they aren't going to be in the forefront of college basketball for many years to come with that young man in charge. Third year, third NCAA tournament, and they'll be advancing to play the winner of Nebraska and UConn. But meantime, out in Greensboro, Duke and Campbell. Thomas Hill with 16 at last count, Billy. Well, Thomas Hill, as you mentioned earlier, is uh, one of those players that can explode offensively. Every guy in that starting lineup can. Christ Christian Leitner now sitting down. Campbell is uh, working on something right now. They've got 37 points, 43 points, the lowest ever scored in the NCAA tournament since the shot clock has come on. So they've got six more to go. They don't want to have that record behind their name. Uh, they'll beat that record. 11-39 to go in that game. They started to pick up the pace. and They were on a 9-2 run just a moment ago. Hey, let's get you some live action from the Midwest. Houston and Georgia Tech. 
The eight-point halftime lead's been cut to two. Dick Stockton and Al McGuire are there for us. The Houston Cougars, who were dismal in the first half, have come out on fire. Sam Mack with two three-point plays and an 11-0 run carrying over from the first half. Matt Geiger goes inside. And fighting is Mackey, and the basket will count and a foul. What's happening with Georgia Tech in the inside, they're using their wide bodies inside a 2-3 zone, which is giving uh, Houston fits. In the first half, Houston only hit two for 16 from three-point land, but the first two shots they took start in the second half here were both three-pointers by Sam Mack. But Houston has not gotten to the free throw line, and Georgia Tech's defense interior, and they've got some big trees there, really kept them at bay. Well, again, it's, it's the zone, and I think Houston got to start picking up full court, trying to turn over, speed up the game a little bit more. It's too slow for them. Mackey concluded the three-point play, has seven points now, as Outlaw picked up his second personal. The lead is five for Georgia Tech. He's a rare man-to-man. -man. Upchurch goes inside, gets the foul. Geiger, who has to stay out of foul trouble, and so far he has been able But he gave it off to Caesar. Miller. Off the hands of Hamick to Heslop. Off the foot of O'Neill to a crowd. And a held ball. BYU ball. We thought that because of BYU's age and maturity that they would not be as intimidated by O'Neill as most teams are in college basketball. When you watch them play out here, every time they get the ball in the paint area, their eyes are at him. They have to learn how to play regardless of who's in the game on the other side. Shaquille O'Neal leaves to a rousing ovation from the Tiger fans. He departs with 26 points, 13 rebounds, and the record number of block shots, 11. Nixon scores at a quick timeout, the final timeout called by BYU. Those are the numbers for Shaquille O'Neal. The most important number, LSU 92, BYU 83. But we wanted... LSU seconds away from advancing to the second round here in the West Region. They lead by nine. Hummick puts the finishing touches on the LSU victory. Final score, LSU 94 and BYU 83. The Chevrolet players of the game are Kevin Nixon of BYU with 16 points and 6 rebounds and Shaquille O'Neal for LSU, 26 points, 13 rebounds and 11 block shots, a tournament record. Georgetown, Florida State and LSU, the winners here in the West today. The Tigers await the winner of the Indiana Eastern Illinois game coming up next here in Boise. Now for Bill Walton and Andrea Joyce, Sean McDonough saying so long from Boise State Pavilion. Here's Jim Mann. All right, Sean. So all the highest seeds continue to win. The SEC is 2-0, the ACC 4-0 here in the first round. Now coming up next, we're going to send some of you out to Iowa and Texas, 15 minutes to go first half. Others will see UConn, Nebraska, eight minutes to go in the half. Northeast Louisiana, USC about to tip. Indiana's 30 minutes from now. We'll be back after this word from your local station. Brencher penetrates. Nice dish to Burdett. Texas trying to get a timeout. They don't get it. It's a two-point lead for Iowa. Val Barnes is fouled by Wrencher. The Texas Longhorns were underneath the basket calling timeout. Iowa got it in so quickly the referee couldn't grant the timeout. And as a result, Iowa had an advantage going down the court. Boy. Val Barnes, an 86% free throw shooter. He led the Big Ten Conference in free throw percentage, so he's the right man as far as Iowa is concerned. But he misses, and the Longhorns who led the Big Ten in free throw shooting have made just 10 of 18 in this game. Very poor free throw shooting. And that's really a surprise for the Iowa Hawkeyes. Barnes makes one out of two, and it's 92-89 Iowa as we approach the one-minute mark. Barnes pressuring Tyler. Mo 
Moses moves out on Wrencher. Wrencher with a 15 footer. Out of bounds to Iowa with 45.8 seconds left, and the Hawkeyes have a three point lead. Tom Penders wants a timeout. So we'll return to Greensboro as Iowa tries to hold off Texas in a wild game. For Hammer's new video, get a peek at the concert tour of the year and an exclusive backstage look at Hammer from the heart, April 3rd on CBS. Iowa leads by three with less than a minute remaining. The Hawkeyes have had their difficulties in close games this year, and in overtime games, they've lost all three. Iowa with three timeouts left. Texas has one. Pressure by the Longhorns. And Mike Richardson commits the foul. That's the ninth foul on Texas. So one and one coming up for Iowa. The Hawkeyes with some uncommonly poor free throw shooting in this game, though. They are 11 for 19 at the free throw line. At this point in the ball game for Tom Penders, his strategy, if he doesn't steal the ball right away, which he did not, is to foul immediately. Now, if Barnes makes one or two of these, you're still looking for the Texas Longhorns at a two-possession basketball game. If he makes two, that puts them up five. Texas hits a three, then they've got to get the ball back. Barnes shooting a one and one. He's made one out of two. Iowa leads by four. Iowa did a great job the last two possessions defending the three-point line, and they've got to do that again. Dueling Toms, Henders and Davis. Remember, Tom Davis has never lost a first-round game since he's been in Iowa. His Hawkeyes lead by five. Tyler pushes it up. Blocked by A.C. Earl. Big play. That's his third block. Anticipating the defense against the perimeter, figuring maybe the inside would be open. Tyler takes it to the basket, but the big guy is there. The shot clock is off. Wrencher puts up a three. Got it! And Texas calls a timeout as Terrence Wrencher's three-pointer has cut Iowa's lead to two with 34 seconds left. The killer. And the Texas Longhorns have used their last timeout. Also on the next Texas foul, will send Iowa to the line to shoot two free throws. At this point in the game, if you're Tom Penders, that concerns you very little. Tommy Penders is in the game as the designated fouler, so if Texas cannot get a steal, Texas is going to foul right away because you can still trade two for three in this situation. You don't have a lot of time. Oh, you got to get the guy and foul him. They try to get to Moses and finally foul him with 30.1 seconds left, and that's the 10th foul. Nice job by Moses to get the ball up the court quickly. Fourth foul on Richardson. A.C. Earl will come back in for Iowa. Wrencher and Tyler coming back in the ball game for Texas. And Moses, who has had such a great basketball game, goes back to the free throw line. Only one for two from the line, but 21 points, 16 rebounds, eight assists. That Texas is still alive. And the plot thickens here because if he makes this, Texas with a three-pointer ties the game. I always had a history of letting close games get away. Does that come into play in a game like this? Players don't think about it. It worries the coaches half to death, though. Got to guard the three now. Three would tie it. 20 seconds left. Wrencher gets a screen. Wrencher puts up a three, but it's short. Wrencher rebounds, and he is fouled. And that basket won't count. Think about this. That's only team foul number five for Iowa, so Iowa still has... One foul to give before they even go in the one and one. And at this point, the only thing that can beat Tom Davis's team is a three-point shot. So that is not a bad foul at all. 15 seconds left. Three-pointer. No good by Cambridge. And Earl grabs the rebound and is fouled. Dexter Cambridge missing the three-pointer from the corner. He's not really the guy Texas wanted to take the three. Cambridge only one for nine on the year from three-point range. 
But Dexter feeling the shot clock was, the, the game clock was running out and seeing how well defended Wrencher and Tyler were, decided since he was open, he'd give it a go. And A.C. Earl, a 67% free throw shooter, goes to the line. He's made two of four tonight. One wins the game. by four free throw shooting for most of the game cashing in now and Tom Davis wants a timeout as A.C. Earl has given the Hawkeyes a four point lead Iowa has been able to stay with Texas fast pace in this game the Hawkeyes 96 points is the most they scored in the last 19 games since they put up 121 against Centenary Texas is out of timeouts A.C. Earl with one free throw remaining he can put his Hawkeyes up by five and send them on to a matchup with Duke on Saturday. Since Texas has no timeouts remaining, for all intents and purposes for the Longhorns, there's only 6.2 seconds left in this game because even if they score, they can't force Iowa to throw the ball in bounds. Earl has 25 points. He's in a tremendous second half. Now they got hurry. <laughs> oh, picked off. That should do it. Rencher attempts to tie Barnes up and commits a foul. So the Hawkeyes are on their way to face Duke. Terrence Rencher has just fouled out. He and B.J. Tyler were just terrific. He's scoring 26 points for the Longhorns. It was Texas backcourt scoring against the frontcourt scoring of Tom Davis Hawkeyes. How do you see a possible Iowa Duke matchup? Obviously, Iowa has the inside power to compete with Duke's inside power. It will be very interesting to see. Duke is the kind of a team that has just as much athletic ability as a team like Texas. So Iowa had to get by Texas. They've got a really tough game, obviously, coming up. See what they have left. Well, Barnes drops in his 20th point of the game. And Iowa has this one locked up with three and a half seconds left. The Hawkeyes will win their 19th game of the year, and Texas season will come to an end. All the Hawkeyes have to do now is walk off the court because Texas cannot stop the clock. And that'll do it. A wild, fast-paced game. Iowa had four starters in double figures. As they hold off Texas, 98-92 to advance to the second round, the matchup with the Duke Blue Devils. So it'll be Duke against Iowa, Missouri against Seton Hall on Saturday from Greensboro. The Chevrolet players of the game are James Moses of Iowa at 22 points, 16 rebounds, and eight assists, and B.J. Tyler of Texas, who scored 26 points. But Iowa shot 71% in the second half to win this game, 98-92 over the Texas Longhorns. Let's go to Jim Nance in New York. So the Southwest Conference is now out of the tournament, both Texas and Houston losing tonight. Duke and Iowa, by the way, a year ago, Duke won by 15, 85 to 70, set for a second round rematch. We're going to get you out to get a look at USC, the Trojans, the two seed in Milwaukee. We'll get you there in just a moment. Championship. else to take you right now folks that's the last game on today's menu as you look at the west grid let's send you out to boise sean mcdonough and bill walton are out there for us take it away gentlemen and to those of you just joining us welcome the first round action in the west region indiana taking on eastern illinois the hoosiers in white i'm sean mcdonough with bill walton indiana jumped off to a 10 nothing lead and their largest lead is their current lead, 37 points. The winner of this one, it will be Indiana, will take on LSU on Saturday. And in the other action here in Boise on Saturday, Georgetown will meet up with Florida State. Those are the matchups we anticipated, and those are two marquee matchups to be sure. The Indiana LSU matchup as we get a good look at Bob Knight berating the officials with a huge lead. <laughs> Don't really understand that. But that matchup, those two teams have met twice before, both in tournament action. Indiana's won both of them, and both times they've gone on to win the championship. Chris Reynolds just fouled out with four points. In the line on four, Indiana. Of course, one of the most vivid images of the NCAA tournament in recent years. 
during the Indiana LSU game in the tournament a couple of years ago. Bobby Knight pounding the phone at the scorer's table in front of Gene Corrigan. We'll have to get to the bottom of the true story about whether he and Dale Brown have really patched things up or if there's still some problems in the relationship. There's different stories depending upon whom you speak with. I know you talked with Dale Brown on the flight out here the other day. Dale Brown feels that he has buried that hatchet with Bob Knight. He called Bob Knight after he re read a very interesting story in the newspaper. A person in Baton Rouge had been killed in an act of mindless juvenile delinquency in Baton Rouge. The father of the victim said, I think these young men are generally nice people. I have to put this aside. When Dale Brown heard that story, that act of compassion by that father, he called Bob Knight on the phone. They've been good friends ever since. Todd Lindemann gets it to drop in. Now we just have to hear Bob Knight's side of that. I was going to say, <laughs> I'd be anxious to hear if he has the same account of it. Maybe Bob Knight just doesn't accept collect phone calls, and that's why he pounded that phone. <laughs> Eric Landris guarded by Leary. Now Jordan couldn't drive on Anderson. Troy Collier off the mark, rebounded by Lindemann. You can see steady improvement in Todd Lindemann as the season has gone along. Aaron pass. Leary was trying to find Anderson. It was nowhere near him. 5.03 to play. Indiana has never trailed. Allen Henderson leading the way, the freshman with 17 points and 10 boards. And Indiana really hasn't let up. They shot 68% of the first half. Indiana win. And a fitting ending as Henderson blocks the shot of Jordan. Allen stepped out of bounds with 2.8 remaining. The Chevrolet players of the game, Steve Rowe of Eastern Illinois, 10 points and three assists. And Allen Henderson, 19 points, 10 rebounds. Three block shots and three steals. Jordan launches one of the buzzer, and that's it. The final score, Indiana 94 and Eastern Illinois 55. Saturday here in Boise, Georgetown will meet Florida State, and Indiana takes on LSU. For Bill Walton and Andrea Joyce, Sean McDonough saying so long from Boise, Idaho. Let's send you back to the studio now in Jim Nance. All right, Sean, good night to you. So March Madness on opening day, really, Billy, was completely sane. It was. There was no full moon tonight, Jim. And you've got the power conferences won 10 games. ACC 4-0, Big Ten 3-0, Big East 3-0. Of all the games today, 16 games, the highest seeded team to lose, eighth seeded Texas, eighth seeded Nebraska. Let's set that lineup for you for tomorrow here on CBS. Coming up, actually, it's today if you want to be official, 12 noon Eastern, 12:15 uh, tip. But at 12 noon, Pat O'Brien and Mike Francesa will be in the chairs for the start of Tulane, St. John, Southwest Missouri State, Michigan State, or Old Dominion, Kentucky. The afternoon uh, schedule has New Mexico State, DePaul, or Iowa State against UNC Charlotte, Georgia Southern, Oklahoma State, and Delaware takes on the four seed in the Midwest. Cincinnati. Now, I should mention that to points of natural interest, you'll get the game between Southwest Louisiana and the four seed in the West Oklahoma at about 5:10 Eastern Time. Now, primetime coverage for most of the country begins at 8 p.m. with Billy, your school, Wake Forest against uh, Louisville in the West, or that Howard, Kansas game. For some, the coverage will start at 7:30 with Fordham and UMass in the East, or, or that Temple, Michigan game from the southeast and then on the back half of the night the headliner of the day princeton and syracuse from worcester and robert morris ucla is also on the schedule with utah evansville east tennessee state and arizona that's the schedule for tomorrow day one is complete billy packer and jim nance saying so long for all of us at cbs sports we'll see you back here in about 11 and a half hours as we continue on the road to the final four
next on CBS Sports, the NCAA Basketball Championship. Hi, I'm Lou Conaseca, coach of the St. John's Redmen. If you look at our brackets, you'll see we have a tough, tough road to try to get to Minneapolis. By the way, you wouldn't rough up a Hall of Famer, would you? It's March Madness, here on CBS. The greatest birthday present I can give you is a bunch of more basketball games, right? That's all I could ever ask Happy for. Happy birthday. Thank Hi, you very everybody. Much. I'm Pat O'Brien, along with my partner, birthday boy, Mike Francesa, on this, the first day of spring, and we are midway through the first round of one of the great rites of spring, March Madness. And Mike, uh, so far on the road to the Final Four, there haven't been any significant detours as we head to Minneapolis. No form held yesterday. The only lowest seeds to win were in the 8-9 games, Pat, which set up tomorrow, I think, the best second round of action in the history of this tournament. Now, things to look for this afternoon. How about we look for some new faces? Delaware in for the first time. Tulane in for the first time. And some old familiar faces back. Cincinnati, a storied program, back for the first time since 1977. And Kentucky, which has been to this tournament more times than any team in history, any school in history back for the first time since 1988 under Rick Pitino. Those are things to watch this afternoon. They are glad to be back and let us uh, set the day for you at today's four sites around the country. We begin in Atlanta where Tulane meets St. John's in Southeast region play. Kim Lewis leads that band of super subs they call the posse that helps pace Tulane. While the Redmen turn to Malik Seeley, who is only 42 points shy of Chris Mullins all-time school scoring record. Over in Dayton, Midwest region action begins today with Southwest Missouri State and Michigan State. Junior point guard Jackie Crawford is the leading scorer for the Bears, while the Spartans respond with Respert, Sean Respert, the freshman shooting guard who leads the team in scoring average. And then in Worcester, Mass., uh, today's East action will tip off with Old Dominion against Kentucky. And here's a look at uh, this afternoon's doubleheader games, which begin at approximately 2.40 out west in Tempe, Arizona, where New Mexico State meets DePaul. Some of you will see Iowa State and the University of North Carolina, Charlotte, Georgia Southern versus Oklahoma State, or Delaware against Cincinnati. In areas of regional interest, we'll have southwestern Louisiana and Oklahoma at approximately 10 after 5. And tonight, uh, Jim Nance and Billy Packer will again anchor our primetime coverage, which begins for most of the country at 8 o'clock Eastern time with Wake Forest and Louisville or Howard and Kansas. In areas of local interest, we'll begin at 7.30 Eastern with Fordham versus Massachusetts or Temple and Michigan. Then at approximately 10 Eastern, we'll have our late doubleheader games. Most of you will see uh, Princeton versus the Orangemen of Syracuse. Robert Morris will play UCLA. Texas El Paso uh, against Evansville. And East Tennessee State tangles with the Arizona Wildcats. A lot of basketball here on CBS. And Mike, what are the keys to this uh, second day first round? Well, one of the things we're still looking for, Pat, is a couple of upsets. Before Jim and Billy say goodbye to the first round tonight, we'll have a couple. It's this afternoon, injuries too. Oklahoma, DePaul, St. John's with Robert Wardan, a little banged up. They need key players to be healthy. Last night uh, in Boise, uh, Florida uh, State beat Montana 78 to 68. But in the process, Florida State guard Charlie Ward dislocated his left shoulder. X-rays this morning turned up negative. He does have some stretched ligament and muscle, but the bone is not chipped, we're told. He will definitely miss Saturday's game against Georgetown, and his status beyond that remains in doubt. A story will follow here. We'll be back with a look at how a washed-out program is now riding a big green wave as the road to the Final Four rolls on on his birthday. Stay with us. As we approach tip-off in Atlanta, we find that there's something different this tourney time around. Tulane is back among the pack on the road to the Final Four. Back in 1985, a point-shaving scandal led to this dramatic announcement. I shall recommend to the Board of Administrators and the University Senate that Tulane University immediately terminate its participation in men's intercollegiate basketball. Varsity basketball was absent for four years, but three seasons ago, the sport drew a reprieve, and now, guess who's back? In three short years, Coach Perry Clark has brought the Green Wave back to a crest of success. 
if you were to give him uh, any kind of uh, level of performance from 1 to 10, I'd have to say he's at 10 right now. The first Metro Cop. Yes, we all believe in him. We all love him. Uh, but we all realize that you can have fun and, and joke around, but there's a time when you got to be serious. Well, they went through a lot of heartache, a lot of tough times. They learned from that. They learned from their mistakes. And uh, it enabled them to go on and, and, and to be in the NCAA in the third year. It's a good story. Road to the Final Four continues on CBS after a word from your local station. A lot of hoops today for you. Stay with us. This is CBS. How great would it be to be able to finish off an alley-oop sometime? Anyway, welcome back to our New York studios. I'm Pat O'Brien. He's Mike Francesa, my designated navigator along the road to the Final Four. Yesterday, uh, there were 64 teams. Now there are 48. And when we sign off sometime after midnight tonight, we'll have cut the field in half. Today, we wrap up round one, and we'll begin. Uh, we'll start everybody off in just a couple of moments down in Hotlanta, where Tulane meets St. John's. In other early action in Southwest Missouri State and Michigan State in the Midwest, while Old Dominion and Kentucky clash in the East. Our doubleheader games will tip off at approximately 2.40 Eastern time. Most of you will see Mexico State take on DePaul. Tonight we have another doubleheader headed our way. Our coverage in primetime features Wake Forest and Louisville at 8 o'clock Eastern time on paper, Mike. Uh, almost a dead-even game? It is. Wake Forest has a very exciting player in Rodney Rogers, someone the fans may not have seen. And for Louisville, not a real vintage Louisville team, but when Denny Crum's in the tournament, you watch him. He's been to six Final Fours. He's won two national championships. He's a very dangerous tournament coach. All right, right now we're going to start everybody out uh, with uh, Tulane and St. John's. Those of you scheduled to see Southwest Missouri State and Michigan State will get you there for a 12:25 tip. And in areas where Old Dominion and Kentucky will be seen, we promise to deliver you uh, to Worcester by 12.35, the tip time there. Mike and I will see you throughout the afternoon. Right now, the road to the Final Four springs back into action exclusively here on CBS. Have a great day. <laughs> CBS Sports exclusive coverage of the first round of the NCAA Basketball Championship is sponsored by Oldsmobile, official car for NCAA championships. Pizza Hut. Home of the $7.99 Supreme Pizza Deal. And by Bud Light, everything else is just a light. CAA Men's Basketball Championship continues here in Atlanta, Georgia this afternoon. We continue with our Southeast Regional play. Tonight, Michigan will play Temple, Arizona, East Tennessee State. And later this afternoon, Oklahoma State takes on Georgia Southern. But right now, it's the Tulane Green Wave against the Redmen of St. John's University. And good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Omni here in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm Greg Gumbel, along with Quinn Buckner. Tulane University says we're in the NCAA tournament. That's the first time they have ever been able to say that. An amazing accomplishment for a program, Quinn, that just didn't exist four years ago. Well, Greg, they had the scandal back in 1985, decided to shut the program down. In three years, they have taken it from the scandal situation and the shutdown. Four victories, 13 victories here in the NCAA today. I'm telling you, this is what college basketball is about. Everybody needs a chance to play in this kind of situation. It's a first-time trip for Tulane. However, for St. John's, you You'd have to say they've been here before. There are veteran squad and uh, five seniors on this team, but none that you have to keep an eye on more than Malik Seeley. Well, you know Malik Seeley is going to have the great game because he's the kind of player that everybody's looking at to be a lottery pick. His numbers suggest that he can score, but the thing he's got to do, as well as his entire his teammates, is handle the basketball. Turnovers will be very important. 24 years, Luke Karnasek has been the head coach at St. John's. This is his 24th postseason tournament. The starting lineup, Sport Tulane, David Whitmore, and Anthony Reed up front, Matt Pop in the middle, Greg Gary and Kim Lewis in the backcourt. For St. John's, Malik Seeley and Shonel Scott at the forwards, Mitchell Foster in the middle, Chucky Sproling and Jason Buchanan are the starting guards. Our officials for game one this afternoon here in the Omni, Len Wirtz from Mount Healthy, Ohio, Denny Friend from Arlington Heights, Illinois, and John Lineback from Kansas City, Missouri. And there is Lou Karnaseka. 24 years at St. John's, 18 NCAA tournaments, 6 NITs. 
with the inevitable sweater. <laughs> this one is a little, a little more tamed down, I, I, I should say. Anthony Reed, number 55, jump center against Mitchell Foster, and the opening tap goes to the green wave. Tempo is absolutely the key here. You know Louis Carnesecca will try to have his team be patient. You know, the thing that Tulane wants to do is they need it up quickly. They're a little smaller. They got to get some easy baskets and putbacks. Reed missed the first shot of the game, and back come the Redmen. This is Jason Buchanan. Tulane's in a man-to-man. -man. And the foul is on number 23, Kim Lewis. Well, that, that's a problem right away off the bat, because if you have Kim Lewis trying to guard Malik Seeley by himself, it can't be done. There's a five-inch height advantage for Malik Seeley, and his teammates look for him all the time. Now Tulane is switched up in a 2-3 zone. Try to force the perimeter shot, which is one of the things that is a, a real question mark with St. John. Seanel Scott back on top to Sproling. Sproling on the baseline. Foster had it blocked and was fouled by Matt Pop. Penetration there by Sproling. You don't ever want to play a defense and let somebody force two people to guard one. That time they did it to Sproling, able to find Foster inside. Mitchell Foster will go to the line. Took over with the injury to Rob Wardan, who tore a calf muscle in January and missed the last, oh, the last 16 regular season games. He has been slowly worked back into action, and we'll see some action today, but Foster remains the starting center. Foster is good if you play in, a, in a, an up-and-down situation because he's more athletic, but I think in this kind of game, you'd like the ball-handling ability of Wardan. He's able to get the ball, fan it, find open people should the press become of real importance, of real significance for Tulane. Pop has the rebound, and Greg Gary pushes it up court. St. John's in man-to-man. -man. So trying to force a lot of cuts. Quick hitting plays is what Tulane likes to get. That's the guy that can get real warm on you, if you will. That's Whitmore. Can shoot the jump shot. It's really a very good score. David Whitmore averaging just under 13 points a game. 2-1 Tulane. St. John is facing man-to-man -man again. They, Tulane wants to change up, show him a lot of different looks. Buchanan for Sproler. Seeley lost it on the way up. Foster is there with the follow. One thing you obviously can't ever afford to have is some easy baskets on putbacks that must block up. Tulane wants to take their time. As we come up on two minutes to play in the game. You've got to read that. They, they, every time there's a switch, and St. John's did this, and I said it in the first half, there's been a switch, and Tulane is not recognizing. Buchanan is one of the best at it. And that's a good timeout call because McKeever Perry was just about to get called for the five-second call. St. John's very much alive. 148 to go. Tulane with the basketball and a two-point lead. Greg Gumbel, Quinn Buckner. And Tulane trying to combat... A little tournament jitters here with the lead. Well, they're doing more than that, Greg. They're trying not to lose instead of trying to win. They've had opportunities to, to, to make themselves, you know, put themselves in position to win the game, but they're not recognizing defenses. These are all the things you do when you're trying to win as opposed to trying to make sure you don't throw it away. The guy that they would probably like, I would think they'd get the ball in the hands of is this guy right here, David Whitmore. Whitmore down the lane, he tries to scoop, no. And Foster had the rebound, had it taken away from him. And a jump ball situation goes in favor of St. John's. Well, that's, you know, that may not be a bad play for Tulane. And I'll tell you why. Because that rebound was legitimately St. John's. And what it comes down to is now you get the possession arrow of the chain. So, for example, if there is another jump ball, then it's in favor of Tulane. Greg Gary out of the lineup for Tulane. And number 30, Matt Green in. Whitmore will get what I would think will be a brief spell. He'll get a brief spell. This is a team. This is, Matt Green is part of the, 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 the posse. They can get some energy. They also have bigger people to get some rebounds, which have been a problem for the Green Wave. Chucky Sproling is back in the backcourt. Got to say, John. You've got to find Malik Seeley. Pass in the middle. Taken away by Tulane.
60 seconds remaining in the game. Tulane with a two-point lead and the basketball. And timeout is called by Tulane. Harry Clark going to talk about possibly winning the first NCAA game in Tulane history. 46.9 to play in the game. Tulane with the ball and a two-point lead. More Greg Gumbel along with Quinn Buckner. More importantly, Greg, there are 29 seconds now on the, on the shot clock. to get a shot off before time expires. There's eight seconds remaining on the shot clock. They, they'll get Pointer it. Williams. Yeah, they'll get it to Whitmore or, or, or they give it to McKeever. And he makes it. Yes, Anthony Reed. And with one second on the 45 second clock. Malik Seeley for three. Off the mark. Out of bounds to St. John's with 8.2 to play. Right. And Carlin Hartman checks into the lineup. Getting in the big bodies, big defensive bodies. Tulane University, its first ever appearance in the NCAA. They are 8.2 seconds away from registering an opening round victory over St. John. And they leave Malik Seeley wide open on this side of the court. And he missed it. Foster oh, rejected. Oh, by McKeever Perry. And they have done it. <laughs> That's it. ago the program was simply non-existent on came Perry Clark for the second time in two years he was coach of the year in the Metro Conference and this afternoon they have knocked off the Red Men of St. John's 61 to 57 and a pretty good effort from start to finish well it was a great effort and what they were able to get the, the posse made the difference in the first half and that allowed them to have confidence going into the second half of the game and then they just hung in there and their seniors and their stars brought them along and they got themselves a four-point victory an outstanding effort on the part of the green wave With that victory, Tulane moves on to Sunday afternoon here in the Southeast Regional, where they will play the winner of the game coming up next here in Atlanta between Oklahoma State and Georgia Southern. Our Chevrolet players of the game, David Whitmore of Tulane, 15 points and six rebounds. Malik Seeley for St. John's, he scored 20 points and had four rebounds. Quinn, we talked about how there have been a lack of surprises thus far in the tournament. This one registers as one. Well, I told you that'd be a an upset. <laughs> this was just a great game. You, you know, you, you wonder about experience, but one of the things that inexperience brings is this. I don't know what to be afraid of, because I don't know what I don't know, and I think that was, is what happened to Tulane. They came in, as I talked to Perry Clark, he said he wanted them to lose. I didn't think they were loose at the top of the game. I thought that as the game went on, as I said, they went in at halftime with that lead. They said, guys, we can play with these guys, and then they came out in the second half and were able to keep it close, maintain the lead for the majority of the second half, and were just strong enough to hold it off at the end, and it was a good team victory, and I think that's the thing that they can go home and sit and think about for only a short while, though. You see the Midwest region game, less than three minutes to play between Southwest Missouri State and Michigan State. We'll be taking you to that game shortly. Meanwhile, the folks in New Orleans have to be very, very pleased indeed because what turned into a, I hope we get a bid, has now turned in. Good games has been the afternoon fair here on CBS, and uh, we're going to send you out to Dayton now, where another close one is winding down. 53 to 50 is your score. The Spartans up by three. Tim Ryan, Digger Phelps at the microphones. 
Eight seconds left on the shot clock for the Spartans of Michigan State. Montgomery hits, and they open a five-point lead. Plus, now they're going to the zone defense. They're going to take away the penetration of Crawford, force them to shoot outside. Crawford in and out. 105 to go. Tim Ryan and Digger Phelps here in Dayton. The 12th seeded Southwest Missouri State Bears, who were leading Michigan State, the number five seed earlier in this second half, but the Spartans have come back strongly. Got to get a quick foul. And they do. Well, what Michigan State's going to do right now, they're looking for the right play at the right time. Timeout on the floor, the Spartans by five. Phelps watching Michigan State trying to protect that five-point lead. And they had a, a, an early eight-point lead in the first half, but Southwest Missouri State left, led by a point at the half. And it's been a, the case of uh, little guys against big guys, and it's reflected in the two individual scores. Well, when you look at Jackie Crawford, the 5'7 guard for Southwest Missouri, he just dominated the game, offensively and defensively. Defensively, he bothered Montgomery, and that's why it's such a low-scoring game, because State could never get in their offense. Offensively, in the first half, I thought Southwest Missouri had more penetration. The second half, with only 16 fouls, it shows you that they didn't get into the penetration game they had in the first half, and this is why State has control of the game right now. Senior guard Mark Montgomery at the line for the Spartans makes it a six-point lead. Stevens with 15 points leads Michigan State. The junior forward and a pair for Montgomery widens it to seven. And it's been the rebounding too for Michigan State. Plus Peplowski coming in hitting three baseline jumpers that really iced this game for Michigan State. Gave him the confidence to go. Now State's just going to stay in the zone and force the outside shot. Graves inside is fouled by Respert. The freshman guard for Michigan State. Meanwhile, in Wooster Mass, 64 to 59, and St. John's out of it, dumped by Tulane. Okay, with 31 seconds left, we got to make both foul shots. That's how Southwest Missouri's thinking right now. Go for a quick steal in the press, or go for the quick foul. Still options to try to get this thing to make up the seventh. They cut it to five here. That means you got two possessions. You get two three-point shots. Southwest Missouri State very strong at the line, 77% on the season. And Graves uh, shoots 72% himself from this point. Michigan State, of course, they want to get it inbounds. Know they're going to get fouled, make the foul shot. So he's got a good foul shooting team out on the floor right now, Judd Heathcote. Five-point margin. Under 30 seconds we go. Steal by Crawford, and Montgomery gets it, it back, but it's Bears ball. You may want to take a timeout to set up a key play. Look for a three right now. Charlie Spoonauer does exactly that. 25.9 seconds left. Five points is a lot of points when you look at the score, but it's really quick points. When you take a look at that number five, you still have time to make the two, because if you go for the two, that means you got three left. You can still tie it with a three. And we'll be back in Dayton in a moment. First for three, short, rebounded by the Spartan Stevens. Stevens has been outstanding in the second half. Well, well, I, I thought the strategy there, with with that much time, the 25 was actually 26 seconds. If they went for a driving score, Michigan State didn't want to foul, so at least you're going to get two out of it. Either make the layup, hit a quick score inside by dishing it off to Graves, and I'm surprised that Crawford took that shot. Because if you cut it to three, you call timeout, do what you did to get the ball. Go to your press, look for a steal or a turnover, which Michigan State has had trouble handling this press all day. Now you got a good foul shooter on the line. And that's where the three-point shot can hurt you at the end of the game. So that went right, right for the three uh, to Crawford. Crawford is, is having a little fun with Stevens at the line there. He's talking to him. Stevens calmly made the first for a six-point margin. Now they got to come down and shoot a three. And yeah, makes the second. All time. 16 seconds left. We'll be going to the conclusion of Kentucky Old Dominion from here. That's Murdoch. 10.5 seconds left. Timeout Bears. And a five-point margin again. Michigan State on top. Southwest Missouri State call. Timeout. Lead by five. Stevens will inbound. Got to go for steal or quick foul. Stegen goes fouled. 
Well, he's a 60, uh, 68 point uh, foul shooter now. If he misses both, this kid played some game. What a class kid. I mean, all heart, all spirit, five foot seven, put on a show in this Dayton Arena before 14,000, took control of the whole game, and gave this people what big time college basketball is that the little man can still play. Jackie Crawford, five foot seven junior from Chicago. Standing ovation. Michigan State. Two throws. 16 points on the day. And the guy who ran the offense all day long. And brought all of his spirit. Well, he's the guy that got him here. He's the guy that controlled this game today. And, it, you know, they had some things going for themselves. But I thought in the second half, he didn't penetrate enough like he did in the first half. And they, they played the perimeter game too much. Matt Steginga got 10 points going for 11. And... Now State, things right. away for State just let the clock go right now. They don't even want to touch it. Let them go. Give them the layup. Let the ball go out of bounds. Murdoch driving. Ends up short. Wyshynski just unloads the ball down in the direction of Westford, and it's all over. The Spartans of Michigan State hold up. The Southwest Missouri State Bears who put on a real good show, a tough battle. The number 12 seeds in the Midwest against number five. The Spartans were too good in the second half. Too poised, too powerful, but certainly an entertaining contest with the Bears from Springfield, Missouri, led by their 5'7 guard, Jackie Crawford. Some outstanding inside play by Tony Grave, but you have to credit Mike Paplowski playing on two sore ankles. A good effort in the second half by Chris Wyshynski off the bench, helping it guard and forward. And Michigan State prevails. Judd Heathcote team, Judd Heathcote team advances into the second round here in Dayton. There's the final score, the Spartans 61, Southwest Missouri State 54. And so they will meet the winner of game two, Cincinnati and Delaware. That's coming up here from Dayton tonight. Kansas against Howard and Evansville and Texas El Paso. And our Chevrolet players of the game. For Southwest Missouri State, Jackie Crawford. And for Michigan State, Mike Peplowski. This has been a presentation of CBS Sports from Dayton, Ohio. More NCAA action ahead. Tim Ryan for Digger Phelps returning it out of New York and Pat O'Brien. Thank you very much, Tim Ryan, and uh, more NCAA action right away now as Kentucky has opened it up against Old Dominion. 76 to 61 is our score. 355 left. Here's James Brown and Bill Raftery. Old Dominion with the worst record of the 64 teams built at 15 and 14, trailing Kentucky 77-61. But it wasn't until about the 550 mark of the game that Kentucky was able to shake loose and sprint ahead, ahead of Old Dominion. Old Dominion's problems, Ricardo Leonard, one big problem, averaging 21 points a game. He's got only two points, both from the free throw line. And he doesn't add to it. James Brown along with Bill Raftery and in Ricardo Leonard's absence, if you will, in terms of productivity, P.D. Sessoms has stepped up big, 21 points, 8 rebounds. Kentucky has done the job forcing turnovers and finally connecting on threes. Well, that's the story of the game, threes and pressure. They stepped it up. They had been getting the three-point shots but not converting them. The inability of ODU's press to give them enough opportunities and Leonard, not being himself, has got no DU in this hole. Travis Ford, Darren Feldhaus, Jamal Mashburn, John Pelfrey, and Dale Brown, the five in white for Kentucky on the floor. Kentucky in the midst of a 15-3 run. You mentioned Woods. He gives them that penetration and quickness. And Ford, that outside spread, good passer. Both know how to pressure and trap. Well, who would have thought this? thought it certainly Oliver Purnell did not think that he would have a poor game from his big man Ricardo Leonard out of Washington DC who comes back into the game along with Petey Sessoms replacing David Harvey and John Robinson. Pelfrey got a look that neither one of us would want from our family. <laughs> uh, he did not go over and bail out Travis Ford. Woods is coming in and Pelfrey knew exactly what the look was for. 
So we'll take a look at the bracket here. Kentucky, if they hold on, will move on to wait the winner of the next contest between Iowa State and UNC Charlotte. The rest of the game's taking place later on today. Syracuse in Princeton. And a three by Al Grant and a timeout called by Oliver Purnell. 77-65, Kentucky on top by 12. Left in the game. The Monarchs trailing by 12, trying to make another run at it. Full court pressure on Kentucky. And ODU, Oliver Purnell has had to bring different people in. The pressure worked this time. Not a good pass by Pelfrey. As Ricardo Leonard and Petey Sessions come back in replacing Harvey and Robinson. And you mentioned that Oliver Purnell doing a good job. How so when you, well, when you say they're down when, by 12? When you've got a player like Leonard, and this is, you know, they, they won their conference. They beat which, uh, UNC, Wilmington, Richmond, and James Madison to get in it. And now you have a guy as talented as Leonard not giving you his best game, and he's still finding ways to score and hang in. It's a tribute to him and his staff. Pete Strickland, Tick Price, two of his assistants. And they got to remind you who to put in, and let's go. We got to hang tough. Sesson stepped up a little. Jackson stepped up a little. A masterful coaching job by Oliver Purnell, indeed. He's a coach for the last three years at Radford University. Coming back to his alma mater. And, folks, a lot more action coming your way here on CBS Today. Up next, most of you will see New Mexico State taking on DePaul. That's a 245 tip. Others will see Georgia Southern against Oklahoma State. and Texas El Paso. Arizona. Will be in action tonight. A full day and night of March Madness here on CBS. We've got Oklahoma and southwestern Louisiana after this one, and then Wake Forest and Louisville will precede UCLA and Robert Morris. After our game, we'll be taking you to Worcester, where Iowa and North Carolina Charlotte are locked in a close Iowa State rather and North Carolina Charlotte locked in a close battle a three-point game there with four minutes to play so you'll be seeing that after this one and DePaul still trailing here by seven and they still trail by seven Nathan missed two free throws New Mexico State 64 seconds away from an upset here in the West. They have kept the pressure on. Mark Thompson. And he's fouled. New Mexico State is a very difficult team to press because of their ball handlers. Usually you like to pass against a press and get the ball off court, but they have such good ball handlers. They're so low to the ground, they dribble it right by you. DePaul had won nine of their last 11 coming in, but Joey Myers said we just didn't play well at all in the great Midwest tournament. They were beaten by 20 by Memphis State, and they kind of picked up where they left off at the beginning of this game. And although they've cut it down to a three-point game on a couple of occasions in the second half, it just hasn't been enough so far with 58 seconds left. Losing Curtis Price really was a difference also. I mean, he had been starting, he was playing well. He only averaged four points, four rebounds, but he was an emotional, aggressive leader out on the floor for the Blue Demons. The last time they were within three, it was 66 to 63, and now they need some three-pointers in a hurry. Kleinsmith takes the first one and rattles it off the glass. And a foul in the backcourt. And this one very close to being over for the Aggies. Seventy-six to sixty-eight with less than a minute to play. And New Mexico State from the Big West Conference and from Las Cruces, New Mexico. And they are right next to the White Sands Missile Range where the first A-bomb was tested. And they're about ready to drop a bomb on the Blue Demons of DePaul here in the West Regional as the number 12 seed of Neil McCarthy is about to do in fifth seed of DePaul. New Mexico State's defense just stifled DePaul as far as where they were getting their shots from. They could not get the ball inside. When they would take an outside shot, they were pressured from the 2-3 matchup zone, and the rebounding of the Aggies 
dominated. DePaul, DePaul would get rebounds, but they never converted. Even the hex, towel, and dance on the DePaul bench has not helped here in the waning moments of this one. 77-68. DePaul's got to put it up from three-point land and hope that something will drop. Here it comes from Davis, but he can't find the handle. Doherty finally got it away. Stern. Now Doherty has to take it in the lane. 26 seconds. Nathan. Three chances. No basket for DePaul. And now Sam Crawford and company knows what's going to happen. seconds left. The ball knows it too, what is about to occur as New Mexico State. You think they're not happy? They're shooting down to Paul right now. At one point this season, they were 13 and 1 the third week of January. Their lone loss was to Texas El Paso and they turned around and beat UTEP at the pit, which is not easy to do. Went on to a 23 and 7 mark coming into this, but number 24 is going to be awfully sweet here in about 21 seconds. The big guys inside gave DePaul a lot of trouble. New Mexico State's going to move on to meet the winner of Oklahoma and Southwestern Louisiana. And That'll be some fireworks, too. Well, obviously, New Mexico State doesn't have the height that those two teams do, but they don't have Sam Crawford, either. <laughs> Maybe height's not the key. Lack of height might be. <laughs> Benjamin hits both free throws and goes out to a big hand, 79-68. As Nathan got it to Davis off the glass. It's a two-pointer. That's way too little and way too late. Nice by Terry Davis. And Sam Crawford will make one more trip to the free throw line. That is our number 30, David Booth. Houston. David Booth has filed out. And his career at DePaul is over. The number two career scorer, David Booth, sits down and his four-year stay with the Blue Demons has come to an end. Sam Crawford, all 5'8", 155 pounds of him. You don't judge a player by his size, but his heart. And boy, his is barely fitting in that number 12 jersey so far today. 19 points and 11 assists. And Neil McCarthy couldn't have anybody better at the free throw line. He's 12 out of 14 from the strike today. hit the 20-point mark to be our leading scorer. That's pretty fitting. And now he'll come out and listen to the crowd here for Sam Crawford as he sits down. Final seconds for DePaul as Dee Crawford looks on. Knowing full well that her husband at 5'8 has dominated this basketball game. We've got an upset in the sunny Southwest. New Mexico State 81, DePaul 73. So now the Aggies of New Mexico State advance in the West region here in Tempe. And they'll be taking on the winner of our next game, Oklahoma and Southwestern Louisiana. Our Chevrolet players of the game, was there ever a doubt? Sam Crawford with a double-double, 11 assists and 21 points for New Mexico State, and David Booth, the player of the game for DePaul. We can do it! A happy bunch of Aggies as they win it, 81-73, number 
12 beats number five. Let's go to Pat O'Brien in our studios in New York. Pat. Jeff Mullins isn't arguing. Not at all. <laughs> And Williams nails both. A four-point ball game, under a minute to play. And a foul call on Williams. Lengthening the game, wise philosophy. You, on the other hand, Iowa State, have to make the free throws in this situation if you're going to walk out and move on. And again, both teams in the double bonus situation as Fred Hoiberg travels to the free throw line and 82% free throw shoot. A little better situation. The right to face Kentucky. On the line. And Hoiberg misses the first. As Brian Pearson comes in for Iowa State, replacing Howard Eaton. And when you're out of timeouts, as Charlotte happens to be, giving those fouls immediately, have been able to get this close. Malru Dotton in, replacing Bershawn Thompson. And Lauren Meyer comes in to replace Brian Pearson. One of two for Hoiberg, a five-point ball game with 57 seconds remaining. Iowa State has to make Williams use the dribble, take time to score. Don't want to foul if at all possible. And they must hold him for three. Wow. He gets it. Three-point shot by Odom. 17 points, and it's a two-point ball game. The big guy, confident in his stroke. Earlier took that foul eye. Not everybody expecting Williams. Rodney Odom converting. <laughs> I believe that may have been his first. I was looking at my sheet. I don't think he's taken a three, or is he, that's the first one he's made. It's the first one he's made. <laughs> Unlikely. Bayless with both. 73, 69, 38 seconds left. They could go for the two. Williams and Dotton over the back as Hoiberg will take a trip to the free throw line. Hoiberg showed you something there, didn't he? The physicalness of that particular area of the country, and he's able to hold off enough to get the foul. Again, a review of the scores. Tulane with a big victory over St. John's. Michigan State holding on and holding off Southwest Missouri State. Kentucky with the spurt in the last five minutes of the game, up in the ODU. Oklahoma State, a big winner over Georgia Southern. And Hoiberg missing the first free throw again, the front end of the free throws, causing Hoiberg a problem. Four of six from the free throw line on the afternoon for Hoiberg. 74-69, 30 seconds left. Williams to Terrell, and Terrell. Broadhurst battling, gets the rebound. Can't get the drop, but does on the follow. Got to give one right away. They got the clock stopped as the ball goes into An the... An official stoppage of yeah. play. Three points separating the two teams with 16.1 seconds remaining. And Johnny Orr calls a timeout with Iowa State nursing a three-point lead. Iowa State up by three, 16.1 seconds remaining. The touchdown pass to Hoiberg and the slam. Well, Johnny Orr not sleeping over there. They bear to man everybody, sent the long home run play. And Williams with the three just to narrow the gap. But Iowa State pulls off the upset. The number 10 seed over the number 7 seed by 2.7674. Johnny Orr, whose team did a masterful 
job defensively, specifically Ron Bayless on Henry Williams, although Williams closes up the game with that deep three there. So the final score, game two here in the East region, Iowa State 76-74 over UNCC. So the matchup is set for Sunday between Kentucky and Iowa State. The Chevrolet players of the game are Julius, make that Julius Nikolik, 13 points, five rebounds from Iowa State, and Henry Williams, 21 points and six assists for UNCC. And now, for Bill Raftery, this is James Brown, and we send you back to New York to Pat O'Brien and Mike Francesa. All right, fellas, and we'll hear from them later tonight. They'll run around the building, get some fresh That's air, and be exactly back right. later as we prepare to take leave of you. A reminder that our colleagues Jim Nance and Billy Packer will join you for our primetime doubleheader coverage that closes out the first round tonight. Most of you will see Wake Forest against Louisville, a chance to see the exciting Rodney Rogers in action for the Deacons, or Howard and Kansas. Some of you will get a head start at 7.30 with Fordham against UMass or Temple and Michigan. Then at approximately 10 p.m. Eastern time, our doubleheader games will feature Princeton against Syracuse uh, and then Robert Morris versus UCLA Texas El Paso squaring off against Evansville and East Tennessee State uh, battling Arizona uh, Mike and I uh, thank you for watching on his birthday yes, we'll we do. see you down uh, the road here as we all head down the road to the final four have a good night everybody A partisan crowd of just about 14,000 on hand, and these fans have been rocking and rolling all afternoon. And that's right, they didn't get in when Julia Serving was a student. John Calipari, certainly one of the bright up and coming young coaches in America, fourth season here at UMass. His squad is riding the crest of a 12-game win streak. They were the Atlantic 10 regular season and tournament champions. Nick McCarchuk, fifth year at Fordham, 15th year overall in coaching. Fordham has won 12 of its last 14 games. Set to jump center. Will Herndon for UMass. And Sanford Jenkins of Fordham. UMass controls the tip. This is Anton Brown handling the ball. Fordham man to man, you'll see a lot of zone. I think Herdy got up big enough at six foot three for that center jump. He can fly. And let fly with a jumper. Hopper Williams back out to Anton Brown. And Jenkins with the rebound for Fordham. Fred Herzog, the team's leading scorer at 17 a game, gives the Rams a two-zip lead. And back into the zone, one trip, enough for Nick McCarchuk. His concern, offensive rebounding, and it should be the way you, you mass attack first with Barbie on the last set. Anton Brown, pump fake. And Brown answers right back, averaging 10 on the season. Four 1,000-point career scores on the floor for UMass, three for Fordham. This may be the only game in America with seven guys on the floor, 1,000 career points. And only one ball, JB. That's the guy right there. Prelo on fire. Fordham's got a legit shot. Sean Prelo. And a foul call on Sanford Jenkins. And Bill, you know this team. Shot clock is off, under 20. Got to pay attention to the shooters and Brown's ability to penetrate and find people. Jump stop, nice pass. Good play, Herndon with his what, a dunk. And his pants are still on. I don't know which is easier, the jam or keeping the trousers up. 
UMass closes the half with a 19-9 run and lead it 37-24. CBS Sports exclusive coverage of the NCAA Basketball Championship will continue after this message and a word from your local station. Jim Nance and Billy Packer up next. CBS Sports exclusive coverage of the first round of the NCAA Basketball Championship is sponsored by the people at Nike who encourage you to just do it. Delta Fawcett Company, Delta, the way water is brought to life. And by ITT Corporation, building people's dreams. The road to the Final Four continuing in four sites. Four games in action at the moment. Night two of the 92 NCAA Basketball Tournament. Jim Nance and uh, Billy Packer. And the action is hot right now, in fact, in Tempe. And let's get you there for a live look at Louisville and Wake Forest. It's an 8-9 game in Tempe. And here's Brad Nessler along with Ann Myers. Louisville out in front, 12 to 11 here over Wake Forest, just under 13 minutes to go in the first half in the game that seesawed back and forth in the early stages. Brad Nestler and Ann Myers from Tempe, Arizona in the West Regional, where it's been upset after upset so far today. Talking about both teams liking to play a man to man, and there you're going to get a foul by Troy Smith over the back, but both teams dropping into a 2 3 zone. One of the reasons that Wake Forest is getting going into the zone against Louisville is Louisville is not a great outside shooting team. That is really where their punch is. They're not strong inside, so they're forcing the Cardinals to take those outside shots. They've been very streaky. James Brewer and Brian Hopgood check in for Denny Crumb's Louisville team. And Wake Forest already in the bonus with 12.46 to play. So they're going to shoot the free throws the rest of the half. Derek Hicks is coming off the bench. Phil Medlin started at the pivot spot for Wake Forest. His first trip to the free throw line. Greg Miner pulls off the miss. Playing against a team like Wake Forest with the, the height advantage, the bulk advantage that they have, Louisville has to be very smart, very patient on their offense, and run good fundamental play. Wake in his zone right now. And outside. Brewer had a thought, still thinking about the three. Nice job defensively by the Demon Deacons. We got 12 on the shot clock. Somebody's going to have to put one up. Brewer will be the man. Got it. Fifteen, eleven, Louisville by four. That's their biggest lead. That might be the answer for the Cardinals as far as running the clock down and making Wake Forest play defense. Wake Forest has had trouble offensively. They've missed six of their last seven shots. They keep getting those rebounds. They keep getting the offensive boards. Owens is fouled from behind. As Sullivan will pick this one up. out in front of a senior filled roster for Dave Odom. Odom in his third year at Winston-Salem. Billy, you once wore the Wake uniform. How do you see this game tonight? Well, I think it's a two very evenly matched teams, both of which played aggressive schedules. Uh, both uh, had a hard time getting that 20 win mark this year. Neither one accomplished that feat. But uh, two very experienced teams out there, and I think the game, the, the score of the game right now is indicative how close these two teams are, and it should stay that way the rest of the game. And let's check in live right now in Dayton in the Midwest, 9.30 to go in the half. The one seed Kansas in action, and here's Tim Ryan. Welcome to those joining us here in Dayton, Ohio. The top seeds, Kansas Jayhawks in the Midwest, have a 23-11 to 11 lead over the 16th seed, the Bison of Howard in Washington, D.C., Kansas looking very strong to start this game. They've used a lot of players, and they've all played well. Kansas, of course, goes through their depth. They play a lot of pressure defense. On offense, they move the ball so well around. They don't dribble that much around the perimeter. They just pass that ball and get you moving on defense and look for the opening inside. You saw Howard coach Butch Beard against Roy Williams of Kansas. Williams in his fourth year. Lost in the final to Duke last year. Love to get that chance again, Duke. Playing. Oster tag, a freshman from Duncanville, Texas. 
Howard just doesn't have the size to compete inside, not just rebounding, but also playing post-defense. Billy, Kansas is your pick in the Midwest, and uh, you see him getting back to the championship game like a year ago? Uh, Jim, they're a solid favorite. They're number one seed in the region. I see no reason why they shouldn't. Uh, not much in their way here tonight, certainly, with 16 seed Howard just doesn't have the personnel to play against a club like Kansas. Let's set the lineup for the back half of the doubleheader. Most will see Princeton against Syracuse. Some will see Robert Morris against uh, the number one seed in the West, UCLA. UTEP and Evansville, East Tennessee State against uh, Arizona. One other game uh, active right now, and that's in the Southeast Temple against Michigan, and they're about to start the second half. Billy, the Wolverines, the young bunch, leading by nine. They had a much bigger lead, Jim. They were up as much as 14 in that game. It looks like Weber off to an excellent start, as is Howard on the inside. So they do have uh, inside power over Temple, but that Temple zone could cause problems in the second half. Some of the scores from earlier today, the biggest story so far, USL, as they call themselves, southwestern Louisiana, the 13th seed in the West, takes out a Sweet 16 team, the 4 seed Oklahoma. 87-83 uh, to 83 was the final in this one. And uh, next up for the Ragin' Cajuns will be New Mexico State as the Aggies won their first game. New Mexico State winning for the first time in the NCAA tournament since 1970 in the third place game at the Final Four when Lou Henson was the Aggies coach. Billy, this is Sam Crawford for New Mexico State. Sam Crawford had a big day in every respect. Assists, scoring steals from the outside and DePaul they turn the ball over 18 times here we see Booth going back up with a power move inside uh, he did some decent scoring there's a man that would like to have been a participant in this year's tournament Jerry Tarkadian sitting with a man Bill Bradshaw the athletic director at DePaul wishes his team had advanced a little further than one game so a 12 and a 13 will play on Sunday. And other scores today, Iowa State took out the 7th seed. Charlotte, UNC Charlotte, losing by 2. Kentucky, the 2 seed in the East, broke open a close game with 8 minutes to go to, to beat Old Dominion. Delaware, not much of a fight today against Cincinnati, the 4th seed in the Midwest. Michigan State, this game was tied with 3 minutes to go, but then Mark Montgomery, their point guard, took over and they won it by 7. Oklahoma State, the first team to reach the 100-point mark in this tournament. The 2 seed in the Southeast advances and and Tulane, the 10 in the Southeast, beats St. John's, the Big East team that went all the way to the regional finals last year, goes out today in round one. And the road to the final four on CBS continues in a moment. Eddie Jones is conditioned when we come back. 3.51 to play. It's been a, a well-played game, been a lot of action. Inside, you know that it gets pretty rough. One of the things you'll see right here in the center of your screen, you'll see Chris Webber come down and hit Eddie Jones on the bridge of the nose. It looks as though Jones went down. They took him to the sideline. They're taking a look at him, but it looks as though he got hit on the bridge of the nose, and he's up. And John Cheney is now looking at him because he's that's a person that you want to try to get back in the game if you can because he can create his own offense, something that not many of the Temple Owls are able to do. Meanwhile, we are under 345 to play for the game. 62-59, Michigan with the lead. Greg Gumbel, Quinn Buckner here at the Omni in Atlanta. Brunson, the freshman, has replaced Eddie Jones in the Temple lineup. Well, the, the, so far, what, what's going on here, Greg, is that Michigan lost his, his cool, basically. They, they, they made some inexperienced mistakes, and they lost it, and now you're seeing that they that was an athletic move that allowed that to happen. Ray Jackson is one of the best jumpers on the team, and he came back and made up for a mistake because he got beat, and those are the kind of things that Michigan can do, but if they play you just straight up, they can make a lot better things happen for themselves. Jackson, that shot will not count. Juwan Howard obviously very pleased with the call. <laughs> the foul is on. Aaron McKee. That's number three on McKee. And it'll send Ray Jackson to the line. No, they got it out of bounds. They haven't got, that's only three team foul. I don't think John Cheney wants a timeout. The foul was before Jackson attempted the shot. It'll be Michigan ball when we come back. Just under three minutes to play in the game. Michigan with the ball and a three-point lead, 62 to 59. You see the timeout situation and the possession arrow favors the Wolverines. 
Craig, they've been able to hold on to what Reeves have because they had a chance to, to break down when they, the score got tied after being up as much as 14. And Jawan Howard got his fourth foul, and they were able to bring in Hunter, and they kept the lead from getting too far away from them, and they got Jawan Howard in. And he's played like the last three and a half minutes with four fouls, and that's helped because he creates other opportunities. Rose to Jackson on the baseline. Like that, because you've got to be aware of both Howard and Weber, and you let Jack, people like Jackson get free. Michigan by five, under two and a half to play. This is the freshman, Brunson, driving, won't go for him, and Howard has the rebound. And, and that's a freshman mistake because you don't have much chance of getting that one in the basket because these guys have just been shutting it off at Michigan. Eddie Jones, who was helped off the court, went briefly to the locker room. He is back and will check in at the next dead ball. See, they can bring these guys out. You know, so got Howard out on the, on the floor. They have to. Weber can come out. Weber wanted that one. And the foul is oh, called. They call it a, a deliberate foul, an intentional foul. And John Cheney is livid. That's two shots in the ball. John Cheney cannot believe the call. I mean, it, it goes around him. It grabs his shirt. That's pretty deliberate, because it wasn't exactly like he had his finger caught in his shirt. I mean, it looked as though he grabbed it because he realized he got beat. And Chris Weber, who shoots just 49% from the line, misses the first. Well, the, 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 And glares at the basket. It's always the basket's fault. It's like when it goes out of bounds. It's, you know, if somebody throws you the ball and it goes out of bounds, it's the ball's fault. But they get the, bas the ball back as he makes that one foul shot. Michigan leading it now 65-59 with a minute 45 to play. Temple has now gone scoreless over the last six minutes and has missed seven straight shots from the floor. And you know, that's been about as long as Juwan Howard has been back in the game. It really has been. A minute 40 to play. Today, and now Michigan is going to, going to play keep away. And there's the foul committed by Aaron McKee. And that'll send Jalen Rose to the line. And Rose shoots 76% from the line. Now it won't send him to the line. That is the fifth team foul. Temple just hadn't been able to get any scoring. Oh, they just missed the lob because Chris Weber had his man beat. And Jones thought he had him tied up. Instead, a foul has been called. Gore's foul, that's his third. Arizona plays East Tennessee State next. The winner of this game will play the winner of that one on Sunday. Well, what's this? That's a key hit the line. Now, did they call the foul? That's a good call because there's no question about it that Jimmy King went across the line and the official momentarily held up on blowing the whistle, but he, he knew that something was out of whack and eventually makes the right call. That's the third personal on Eddie Jones and that will send Jimmy King to the line and they're now in the one and one and they had those fouls to give to stop the clock and they're going to force Michigan who as a team is only about a 64 percent free throw shooting team so that's a, a good move put them on the line see if the freshman can drill them Jimmy King says I can Michigan 66 Temple 59 your temple you've got to get the you go down you got to get a get some quick get a quick shot a good shot and when you come back if you're going to foul anybody chris Webb is the guy i put on the line king gets them both michigan 10 for 14 from the line tonight and you put weber on the line he's a 49 percent foul shooter car starfin three-pointer doesn't go loose ball picked off and scored <laughs> 67-61. We'll return to the Omni in Atlanta after this word from your local station. You're watching CBS Sports exclusive coverage of the NCAA Basketball Championship. 
and welcome everyone. Those of you joining us here at the Omni Temple fought back from a 14-point deficit, briefly grabbed the lead, but now Michigan has taken charge. They have the ball and have been fouled in the backcourt. Well, they, they really have, Greg. They had a chance, if you will, to, to really just kind of give in and let what was going to happen happen. I, Temple came out, shot the ball pretty well. They played well defensively. Juwan Howard picked up his fourth foul, went out. Michigan sub subsequently went down, and all of a sudden Temple was up. And then the next thing you knew, Howard comes back in the game. He's a threat. You worry about him. Jackson gets free. Jalen Rose makes two off the glass, and you see Michigan's got themselves up six with a minute ten to go here. You saw the Massachusetts Fordham final. Those of you in the New York area will be showing you the ending of that game coming up shortly. This is not the guy you want to buy. I mean, you almost have to force the ball in the other direction because Jalen Rose is a 75% foul shooter. You need to force it to Chris Weber. Jalen Rose now 25 points shy of passing Mike McGee to become Michigan's top scoring freshman of all time. A minute 10 to play, Michigan leads it. A minute 10 to play, Michigan with its five freshmen back on the court, leading 69-61. Michigan with two timeouts remaining, Temple with one, and the possession arrow favoring the Wolverines. They need, Temple needs to come out now and just try to find out where you get some, some quick baskets, and then they have to start fouling on the part of Michigan. Brunson, out of bounds to Michigan. All right, we talked about freshmen and the mistakes that can be made, and John Chaney sees that he's got a freshman in, and Brunson, he wants this kid to be able to contribute. He's got him in in the game, and, and that's just to give him some experience. And you see right there on the other side, the quick foul on, on Ray Jackson. But they want to give Rick Brunson some experience. But he's got to learn that you can't go into traffic, jump in the air, and then try to look make a play because it, it, it just won't happen. And Johnny Connick, number 22, coming into the lineup. Michigan Temple, the winner will face the winner of our next game here, Arizona, East Tennessee State. Earlier today, Tulane and Oklahoma State qualified for the next round of action on Sunday afternoon here in Atlanta. Aaron McKee with the ball for Temple. We're down to about 50 seconds. Three-pointer on the way. No, tap back. Karstarfin. And McKee takes it back inside, scores, and they call a timeout. 43.8 to play. 69-63, Michigan. We'll be back. Here in the Southeast region in Atlanta, 43.8 to play. Michigan leading Temple 69-63. to Temple is now out of timeouts, and Michigan with the possession arrow favoring them. Oh, this is a... And there is a foul before the ball is inbounded. On number 22, Johnny Connick, I believe. That's his first. Who, the, the problem is who he fouled. <laughs> he fouled Jalen Rose, and if you're going to get a foul, again, I, I've said the person you need to foul is Chris Weber, so you've got to be, be concerned. Jalen Rose is three for three. So, as I said, he's a 75% shooter. And in the final two minutes, or since two minutes, since the two-minute mark, Michigan is five of seven. And Rose missed one. Well, the thing about Michigan and the reason that you, you would foul normally, but Michigan, Michigan as a team is only a 64% foul shooting team. And Steve Fisher knows you've got to be able to shoot some foul shots if you're going to try to go after the, this whole deal here in the final four to get the championship. So that's got to be a concern because those are two misses right there with no time on the clock. No time with the left guard to go off the clock. Car Starfield. Brunson. And the whistle blows. And is that on Polinka? It is on Rob Polinka. But it gives them a chance to make some shots without, you know, time running. Except the problem with Brunson is he's uh, struggling at the foul line. He's only about 61% too, so he, he's got the right idea if he's going to get to the basket, but he's got to be able to drill them too. Shot that one like he knew what he was doing. 
34.1, the time showing on the clock. Brunson can cut Michigan's lead to five. You force him to get it in and foul it. They, they let him get away. Weber grabbed the rebound. Brunson fouled Rose. And then that's exactly what uh, the John Chaney is telling is, is that you should have fouled Weber. Temple and Michigan have met just once before. Temple won at 42 to 32 back in the 1933-34 season. You remember that, Quinn? Yeah, you read it in the newspaper the next day. <laughs> <laughs> Don't even try that one. <laughs> Rose has 18. And of all the people on the team, this is the guy that likes to have the ball down the stretch. And, and part of it is he has so much confidence in his ability to make foul shots. McKee fakes once traveled before he got the shot off. Inbound to Rose. Polinka. Oh, no. That and McKee cool. stole it. And, and the lob pass. Connick. They don't have any timeouts. 71-66. And you got to say the, the experience wasn't able to overcome the talent, and that's what you've got in terms of what Michigan has. They've got five players that have, they are very, very talented. And they've been able to play up to that talent for, for the better part of 40, 40 minutes tonight. They, they went through about a three and a half minute stretch where they lost their concentration. Juwan Howard got in foul trouble and they, they got themselves in a position where they, they almost got themselves beat. But right now they got a five point lead with 6.8 seconds. And a very good free throw shooter in Rob Polinka at the line. And Polinka hits them both. Well, the game that's going to have to be played after this, you know, Arizona's got to play East Tennessee State, but it's, it's going to be a good one. But I'm telling you, these are first-year players. They took a good challenge here, Greg, because it was very easy for them to just kind of fall back and say, yeah, we got off to a great start, you know, with freshmen. We don't know quite how to close this thing, but they came back with it and came strong and got themselves away with a 73-66 game here. Temple finishes its season at 17 and 13 after a second place finish in the Atlantic 10 concert conference. And we now have three winners moving on to Sunday's action here in Atlanta. Tulane, Oklahoma State, and now Michigan. And the Wolverines will see who they'll play, Arizona or East Tennessee State. Well, I'm sure Michigan is going to sit around and probably watch a little bit of this game. As I saw Arizona come in early, and they came in, and, and they were keeping an eye on Michigan. I saw the guy standing on the side, anxiously checking him out, saying, who is our potential opponent here? And they thought there was a good chance that Michigan might be the game. Quinn, you and I talked during the game about this this attraction and this this this, this feeling that the that the that the freshmen bring to their fans. They talk about whether or not they're going to uh, uh, going to be able to carry this entire thing, and you really don't know just how well they're going to play. Well, well you don't because you know young players can do a lot of things, and and they can sometimes play well, and then sometimes they they struggle. But these guys have played well today. Take a look at the brackets in Greensboro. Duke defeated Campbell to move on to meet Iowa, which was a winner over Texas. Missouri over West Virginia. And Seton Hall beat LaSalle. And those games will take place tomorrow. Now in Worcester, Massachusetts, Kentucky beat Old Dominion today. Iowa State over UNC Charlotte. Massachusetts defeated Fordham. And the winner of that Massachusetts, or the winner of uh, the Syracuse-Princeton game, will take on UMass. 
right now, Quinn Buckner is standing by with Chris Weber and Jalen Rose. Quinn? Well, I'm standing here with, with Chris Weber right here, and this is Jalen Rose. Chris, you guys came out and played pretty well, but you seem to have a law. What do you think happened? Well, yeah, but you know, I don't think any of the NCAA teams played as well as they could the first day. We were getting a lot of jitters out, and uh, we hung tough at the end, and we showed that we were mature enough to keep a lead and to win, and uh, I'm just happy. I thank God that we can win. Congratulations on the game. Jalen, guys seem to struggle. You seem to be the man to step up. Is that something you like doing? Well, I'll do whatever it takes to help us win. I mean, it was a good team effort from start to finish. But Triple did a good run on us, but we sustained and we won the game. Okay, I'm standing here with Coach Fisher. Coach, you got some young players. They, they're freshmen, but they, they showed today that they could withstand a good bump and come back and play pretty well for you down the stretch. When we've done that all year, uh, they're talented young men that uh, we're past the freshman stage that they're winners, too. So I'm not surprised that we fought back. Uh, Temple made some big time baskets from long range and our kids kept fighting. Good victory for us. Coach, I want to congratulate you on a great victory. Good luck to you on Sunday. Thank you. I want to turn it right back to Greg. Greg. Quinn, thanks very much. Our final score. Well, Michigan a winner in our Chevrolet Players of the Game, Vic Karstarfen for Temple, and for Michigan, it's Juwan Howard. You've been watching CBS Sports exclusive coverage of the NCAA Championship. Let's send you back to New York. Jim Nance and Billy Packer, take it okay, away. Okay, thank you very much. And the Fab Five into the second round, and the Big Ten, Billy, is 5-0 and oh and oh. in the tournament thus far. Massachusetts is into the second round, its first win ever in the NCAA tournament. And let's show you the closing seconds of that game. James Brown and Bill Raftery had the call from Worcester as the Minutemen made it to the second round. So John Calipari with a very talented squad and Billy actually showing a little bit of mercy by having his starting squad before being taken out run a weave to work some time off the clock. Well, they, they did early. Then <laughs> they like to go and but the only way they'll stop is putting them on the So with two minutes to go, he did get the B team in. So Massachusetts will advance on to the second round of play. And off the glass, and Chris Robinson will tell you after the game, that's the way I planned it. <laughs> Fordham not able to extract any revenge against UMass. Again, I mentioned, as I mentioned earlier, I lost by four last year, one year to the day, in NIT play to Massachusetts. An 85-58 victory here. So three quarters of the bracket here are set. Kentucky and Iowa State will play on Sunday. Massachusetts will now await the winner of the next contest between Syracuse and Princeton. John Calipari, a hot name in college basketball coaching, Billy. He is, Jim. And you know about this ball club. They came in with five starters scoring in double figures. They do it again tonight. Lou Rowe high with 19. It's tough to defend a team where they can come at you, and any one of five guys could be the leading scorer in a given game. All right, Billy. They've started, or they got the tip time set for a 10-04 start for Arizona East Tennessee State. In the meantime, let's get you back to Louisville and Wake Forest and Brad Nessler and Ann Myers. We welcome those of you who watched Michigan down Temple. The young Wolverines a winner in that one, and the young Louisville Cardinals on the verge of beating a veteran Demon Deacon team of Wake Forest in this one. Wake Forest has struggled to get the ball inside against the 2-3 zone. Louisville has really done a good job defensively, forcing them to take the outside shot and keeping them off the glass. That's been the biggest thing. Louisville has controlled the 10 seconds now on the shot clock. And that's the kind of defensive patience that I'm speaking to. Nice pass by Hilscher, but off the hands of Mooney. And with those 11 passes, usually before a shot, it really does test the defensive patience, and Beheim knows it. And is this guy a character? <laughs> Look at the hairdo. Well, he doesn't spend a lot of extra dollars <laughs> having that do refined. But, you know, they're the only club... I got a little problem with the clock. They're the only team in the country, though, when you think of it, that runs the basketball not to get the ball to the box, but to look for the open jumper if that's what you're going to give them. They're content. 
And it, Billy, I was just about to make mention that the reason there was a problem, the 32.5 seconds left on the game clock, there were 33 seconds left on the shot clock. I think a bit of a problem. Yeah, a little difficult. <laughs> well, you Ivy League guys can pick that up. But Pete anguishes over each pass, each missed pass. Uh, where's everything on that face? Now, if he anguishes over each miss or pass and shot, what do you think the opponents do? <laughs> well, you know coming in what you're going to get. Nice. Edwards, nice attempt on a pass there, but good defensive alertness on the part of Princeton. Five seconds left. And Edwards, the man who had a big game in the second half against Seton Hall and won the game for Syracuse, had a big first half here. Oh, uh, did this kill Pete Carell? He ended up whacking the table. You could have just held it in the backcourt instead. Instant offense. Edwards out of Jersey. Uh, Jimmy obviously regaling with that change of events. <laughs> Fortunately, it's his program and not his head. Easy game to coach, isn't it, JB? That's the end of the first half with the score. Princeton trailing Syracuse by five. Sports exclusive coverage of the NCAA Basketball Championship will continue after this message and a word from your local station. A look at the action from four angles. Night two of the NCAA Basketball Tournament and Syracuse leading over Princeton 28. 23 at halftime. Jim Nance along with uh, Billy Packer. I thought you were doing your taxes over here, all this paperwork, Billy. Got it all, Who Jim. is that on the tie, by the way? Here, You know numbers. Who's this? What's that number? Oh, of course. Who is it? Michael Jordan. And check this out. He has his own brand of ties now. Signature. How about that? <laughs> Michael Jordan. How many people have one of those? You can probably get one. I know telling what the price is. You've got all the connections, that's for sure. Right now, let's connect you with the action in the southeast in Atlanta. East Tennessee State giving Arizona fits. Arizona's the three seed. Here's Greg Gumbel and Quinn Buckner. Welcome, those of you joining us here at the Omni in Atlanta. We're just under six and a half to play in the first half. East Tennessee State and Arizona are tied at 28. ETSU with the basketball. Jason Nibla, three-pointer is good. And the Bucks have been stroking three-pointers tonight, and they lead it 31-28. Well, Greg, that's, a, that's it, the story here. They have been shooting the three-pointers, and all of a sudden, Arizona's got to go out and guard those guys shooting three-pointers, and then you'll see some back cuts to the basket, and Arizona isn't able to protect because the help is gotten the ways to go out to protect from the three-point shot. Offic for three. And the Bucks with the rebound. East Tennessee State is eight for 13 from three-point range. Telford. And Rodney English will look at it and put it up. They gave him time to look at the basket. Womack has got to go out there. You can't let a guy size it up twice. Nine for 14. 34-28 lead for East Tennessee State. Womack, short hook is good. And he's going to turn that way every time because Marty Story can guard This is Talford. And that was off Matt Offick, who happened to be standing out of bounds at the time. Okay, so 5-11 to go in the first half. East Tennessee State by four. And... Uh, Billy, you know, at the start of the night, many will recall you said the Buccaneers would give them fits. Did you actually pick the upset? Can we mark it down? Uh, no, I, I don't pick games, but, Jim, I really felt that this team, with their senior leadership, you know, if they hadn't had the injuries, this team might have gone a long way in last year's NCAA tournament. Let's set the lineup uh, while we have a chance for tomorrow's quadruple header Saturday. It all starts at 12 noon Eastern. Mike Francesa, in fact, will join Billy and I here in the studio. 12-10 tip for Iowa against Duke. That'll be followed uh, in the second set of games. Some will see Alabama, North Carolina, or Missouri against Seton Hall at about 225. And then we'll go three ways around 435. UConn and Ohio State, Memphis State and Arkansas, Georgetown, Florida State. That's a West battle. And then uh, finally, twofold, LSU and Indiana, Georgia Tech against Southern Cal. That's around 7 o'clock tomorrow night, quadruple header Saturday. It's been upset Friday. Nimblet with the ball. You got to try to get to somebody and follow them. And 
Story to Niblet to Dennis. See, they can't get you. They're having trouble getting to him. This is 30 seconds. In there. He does not want to foul him. And Stoudemire commits the foul on Dennis with a minute 20 to play. Tennessee State. It is the biggest upset of the tournament thus far. And to those of you just joining us here at the Omni in Atlanta, welcome. Greg Dumble along with Quinn Buckner. A minute and 20 to play in the game. East Tennessee State with an eight point lead on the third seeded Arizona Wildcats. Craig, they've been able to just knock down the three-point shot. And, and, and I'm telling you, once you do that, that has changed this game because it has spread out the defense so much that it just has not allowed Arizona any chance to get what they need to do defensively. And they have not taken advantage of getting the ball down into Sean Rooks. And Sean has been a little bit of a problem in that he has been impatient and, and rushed some things and got himself four fouls as has Khalid Reeves, who's fouled out of the game, and Chris Mills. Chris Mills also playing with four fouls. Rodney English. And Niblet. Fouled with one minute to play. Here in Atlanta, this is game four. Pretty interesting day thus far. The winner of this game will play the Michigan Wolverines, who beat Temple. Tulane knocked off St. John's earlier today, and Oklahoma State beat Georgia Southern. Jason Niblett at the line to shoot two. thus far in the tournament, number four, Oklahoma. Arizona is number three here in the Southeast. Great, Arizona's the team I thought had a very good chance to get into the final four because they, they had the, the experience they felt they needed in the backcourt. They knew they had the big people. Rooks hits the three and a timeout, Arizona. 50.8 to play, 81-75, ETSU, don't go away. 50.8 seconds remaining in the game. East Tennessee State leads it, 81-75, and they'll inbound the ball. And they're what they, they call face guarding, and that means keeping somebody all over, and that was a nice little play where you throw the ball to the man out of bounds and you can get it back to him while he's inbound. And the foul on Niblet will send him to the line. The guys in charge of such things say that should East Tennessee State defeat Arizona, it would be the seventh year in a row that a 14 seed has knocked off a three seed in the first round of the tournament. Well, Arizona being the three seeds is clearly having this problem as Matt Osik has just fouled out of the game. So, you know, they, they've really got to stretch to get some people to get into the game to try to be able to get some pass. And now ball handling is, is of a premium with them. ETSU trying to advance to a date with Michigan on Sunday. Tulane will meet Oklahoma State in the other game. I thought when the pairings came out on Sunday, last Sunday, Quinn, at the Southeast Regional was the toughest of the bunch. Well, I think, you know, the games that we've had today have proven that as a rule when you get the kind of play that Tulane has had and East Tennessee State has had. And i got to tell you, uh, there was some question by some people as to whether or not Michigan was going to hold up to, to their seeding, and they proved that they could do that. So we, it's pretty much come out the way that you, you thought it would anyway. You're, you're pretty good at these things. <laughs> being 
being said on the ETSU bench for Jason Niblett. Greg, I can guarantee you, they're sitting over there ready to explode should they then have this lead when the, 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 the 3-0 show up on the clock. Stoudemire for three. In the A3. That's the and last they have used their final timeout with 36.3 to play. Be sure to check the 36.3 to play in this game, and with Arizona out of timeouts, we'll see ETSU at the foul line. No, they'll be there quite a bit, and they'll, what they'll try to do, you see, they have Arizona has no timeouts. Both teams are shooting two foul shots, and you're guaranteed to see that Arizona is going to foul. The only question is whether or not East Tennessee State is going to make those foul shots. Marty Story will go to the line. Marty Story, the 6'3 senior out of Greenville, Tennessee, has been there twice. He is two for two so far tonight. And Sean Rooks back into the lineup. Well, he's two for two, but he's normally about a 58% foul shooter, so he's somebody that they definitely want to foul to put some pressure on him. But as a, he's played well tonight. Tennessee State, what you need to do is make sure you get somebody on Stoudemire and force him to what would be his right side, but have and, and no fouls. And that's what Alan LaForce is trying to do is make sure they get him up. See, it's hard to keep him going to his right because he, he, he will go to the left. The whistle blows before that shot is off, and the foul is called on the outside. Foul is on number three, Jason Niblett. Number one on Niblett, Stoudemire goes to the line. He has 13 points. I'll tell you what, for a freshman, he's played big. I mean, he's made the plays they've had to have made. If it hadn't been Womack, it's been Stoudemire that really has gotten things done for the Wildcats tonight. He can cut ETSU's lead to three. Almost threw it away. Oh, there's a man wide open under the basket. He was standing under there. Story was. And Sean Rooks just fouled out of the game. But Dennis was doing the right thing. He was trying to protect the basketball, taking his chances that he could shoot it better than anybody else. But Story was wide open. And Sean Rooks with 17 points. Now, the tough part about it for Sean Rooks is that that's the, this is the last go-round for him. And this is his last game. He hadn't been able to, couldn't pull it off. He, they had some shots at it. He was red-shirted the year that they went in 88. So his opportunity to go to the Final Four is going to end right here. 17 points, 10 rebounds for Sean Rooks. And Ed Stokes will come into the lineup. Michigan gets the winner here. Tulane plays Oklahoma State in the other game here in the Omni on Sunday. That's this half of the Southeast region. I would say that's not the matchup you would have gotten a lot of the uh, quote experts to come up with. But that's what makes this tournament, to me, that's what makes it so much fun because I honestly believe that everybody's got a shot. Greg Dennis, his sixth point. He is perfect in three tries at the free throw line tonight. And ETSU wants a timeout. for the final 22.8 seconds. East Tennessee State by five. Arizona has to go the length of the court. And the pressure's on just so they're not allowed to just roll the ball in and, and so time is not used up. Stoudemire for three. Short. 
Dennis with the rebound, and he'll go to the line again, where he is four out of four on the night. You know, early in the game, we had talked about getting Dennis and whether or not the, uh, the Buccaneers were going to get Dennis involved in the game. They really didn't have to do that very much for a couple of reasons. They were getting the three-point activity, go, the barrage going from the perimeter. Sean Rooks kept himself in foul trouble, so much so that Dennis didn't have to be a factor. Calvin Talbot was a factor. They got some play off the bench. I thought Jerry Pelfrey came in and made some good plays for them. Got some uh, rebounds, got some steals, made a big three-pointer for them. They got This is a team victory for East Tennessee State. Let's quickly get to the last seconds now at uh, the Midwest region action in Dayton. UTEP with a three-point lead. The Bear looks happy from the bench. His team in front by three. The old bear, Don Haskins, a three-point lead, 3.4 seconds to go. Young Jim Crows saw his team with a chance there. Case Beer, a star player with a ball in his hands. And nothing good happened for them. Maxie goes to the line. Case Beer and Kokenauer there underneath. And he makes it calmly. Marlon Maxie's had a strong game. Well, this is a big win for UTEP. You know, they kept their composure, kept their poise, got back in it. Evansville played really well to sprint the second half where they were down at halftime but came back, made things happen. Now, when you take a look at the next game here, Kansas against UTEP. 23 points for Maxi and the Miners of Texas El Paso have outlasted the Purple Aces from Evansville and advanced to meet the top seed in the Midwest, the Jayhawks of Kansas. At midnight, but not too late. What a night, what a day. Uh, second day of the 92 tournament, and again, past midnight in the East, but not too late for Cinderella, Billy. Well, I said Cinderella would show up tonight, yeah. but I didn't think it would be Amelda Marcos with all those glass slippers. <laughs> I mean, this has got to be ridiculous. I we have two them. tens, yeah. a 12, a 13, and a 14. But you came up with that one. I, East Tennessee State, I can't believe it. Again, what just finished now, three games just finished. Uh, what happened here, let's give you the scores from the late games. Arizona uh, sliding out of the tournament, a seven-point loss. Evansville and UTEP and Rivera hit a big shot for the Miners in that victory. In the closing seconds, they go on to win by five. And uh, UCLA pulled away late, 73-53. Tracy Murray had 20 as the one seed advances in the West. Now, the rest of the scores. Tulane kind of set the pace for the day.
uh, the first uh, game ever in the NCAA tournament for the Green Wave. In fact, they're the answer, Billy Packer, <laughs> to, the to, the, <laughs> to the only undefeated team in the history of the NCAA tournament. Well, they can't cancel out the rest of the schedule, though, Jim. They've got to play some more. So uh, St. John's is out. Uh, Oklahoma State and Georgia Southern. Uh, Oklahoma State will be next for Tulane. The Cowboys, of course, the two seed in the Southeast. Michigan by seven over Temple, and uh, the young Wolverines were really challenged, uh, Billy, in the late going, and they responded. Impressed by the fact they fell behind in the second half. They're no longer freshmen. Steve Fisher said that, and I would agree with him. How do you think they feel now about Arizona being out well, of the way? That could be another part of experience. You know, you say, hey, we were going to face Arizona. They're not there anymore. And you think you're going to let down. That's not the right thing to do. We'll yeah. see how they re respond to it. Sure looks good, though, for the Wolverines at this time. But the Buccaneers, the story of the first round as they won today. And next, it'll be East Tennessee State against Michigan. Okay, Michigan State won. And uh, let's look at some of the other scores here. Uh, first, uh, the southeast bracket, actually. Michigan, East Tennessee State, Tulane, and uh, Oklahoma State. Billy, some of your thoughts on those games? Well, Oklahoma State, 100-point uh, game. We had two Big 8 teams hit 100. Uh, it looks like the Big 8's still strong, even though they lost one of their members, Oklahoma, today. Okay, let's talk about the Midwest, Billy. Southwest Missouri State and Michigan State, and the Spartans won by 7-61 to 54. Front court scoring 45-22 for the Spartans in that victory. Cincinnati over Delaware, 85-47. to Why isn't anyone showing this team respect? I don't know. Cincinnati looked as impressive as, as, let's say, Connecticut did yesterday. I think two teams really on a positive roll right now. How would you like to shoot 68%? in every game. That's what Kansas did today. Kansas they make a three-point shot, Jim. Yeah, but they still, well, you, you don't need them when Over you're shooting 68%. Three, so got it inside pretty well. 100 to 67. The Jayhawks will make, next take on UTEP. Uh, UTEP a winner by five in a game that just concluded. So in the Midwest, uh, Kansas and UTEP for Sunday. Michigan State against Cincinnati. Well, they've played already this year. Michigan State won the first one. We'll see on the rematch. Let's talk about the East now. Billy Packer, Kentucky and uh, Old Dominion. And John Pelfrey, 22 points, 20 of them in the second half. And his brothers also advanced to the round of 32. Jerry for East Tennessee State. Iowa State over UNC Charlotte, 76 to 74. That's a 10 seed advancing to Today on this wild Friday, UMass over Fordham, and the Minutemen really look good in that game at Worcester, and Syracuse over Princeton by eight, and the Princeton uh, tied the lowest output scoring-wise by a team since the advent of the shot clock in the tournament, 43 points, tying a Temple performance back in 1986. So Syracuse and UMass on Sunday along with Iowa State, Kentucky. Well, an awful lot of Big East fans said, you mean to tell me that UMass is better than any team in the Big East? Now they get their chance to show it. Yeah. Syracuse won Ooh. the Big East uh, tournament, and we'll see what you UMass can do with them. They'll meet on late, uh, late on Sunday. New Mexico State and DePaul and uh, the Aggies uh, stunning the five seed DePaul by eight. The Aggies first win in the tournament since 1970 when they went to the final four. Oklahoma, the four seed in the West, went out. Southwestern Louisiana, the Ragin' Cajuns winning that one 87 to 83 as Byron Starks had 21 points. Uh, Wake Forest and Louisville. Billy, you were disappointed in the Demon Deacons today. Louisville beats them 81 to 58. UCLA again behind uh, Murray. Tracy Murray's 20, wins by 20. So in the West now, the grid looks this way. Uh, UCLA, Louisville. Denny Crum, how about him? Yeah, great matchup. As we said, one of the low points of his career when he lost to Louisville, I mean, when he lost to UCLA in the 75 Final Four, but then one of his greatest moments when he won a national championship in 80 against UCLA. So he returns to his alma mater. Let's set the lineup for tomorrow, which uh, actually starts in about 11 and a half hours here on CBS. You talk about a super Saturday, All-America Saturday. We start uh, here in the studio. Mike Francesa will be with us. 12-10 tip, Iowa and Duke. And then we'll go two ways. Some will see Alabama, North Carolina. Dean Smith trying to make the Sweet 16 for the 11th straight year. Others will see Missouri against Seton Hall. Seton Hall 20-4 and four in the month of March since 89. UConn and Ohio State had the uh, three-way split in the third set of games, Memphis State and Arkansas, some will see, and Georgetown against Florida State. Those games tip around 435. And then LSU, Indiana, Georgia Tech, USC. Philly, they're all there tomorrow, those All-Americans. Well, it's going to be interesting to see that the top five guys in the AP All-American team all will play tomorrow and try to put those teams on their back and carry them. What a wild Friday it has been. We're glad you've joined us. 11 hours, 32 minutes from now, we'll be back. For Billy Packer, Jim Nance, and all of us at CBS Sports, we're saying good night for now. Join Join us tomorrow for round two.
Okay, Duke and Iowa coming up. Mike, again, good to have you with us. Happy nice birthday yesterday. You've lost about 50 pounds, but it looks a little crowded over there. You know, I've lost about 50. I'd like to lose about another 190 to my left over here. <laughs> oh, I, appreciate, I appreciate the welcome. What about Duke and Iowa, though? Hey, Tom Davis, 11-2 and all-time in first and second round games. One of those two losses last year to Duke in this very same round. Lost 83-70. to Mike Krzyzewski now up to 28-7 and as an NCAA tournament coach. Good, good match up there between two outstanding coaches. Coach K for the only 80% in tournament play. That's incredible. Coming up, again, round two coverage starts. Iowa and Duke, Mel Proctor and Dan Bonner will join you from courtside in Greensboro when the road to the Final Four continues here on CBS. CBS Sports exclusive coverage of the second round of the NCAA Basketball Championship is sponsored by Lexus Luxury Automobiles, the result of a relentless pursuit of perfection. Kentucky Fried Chicken, nobody's cooking like today's KFC. And by Delta Airlines, we love to fly and it shows. Today, from Greensboro, North Carolina, we bring you second round action in the East Region as the defending NCAA champion Duke Blue Devils continue their pursuit of a second straight title, meeting the ninth seeded Iowa Hawkeyes. Uh, in action Thursday here in Greensboro, Duke, as expected, advanced with an easy victory over Campbell. Uh, Iowa outlasted Texas in a high scoring game. Missouri beat West Virginia, and Seton Hall had to come from behind to beat LaSalle on Terry DeHara's jumper. Hello, everybody. I'm Mel Proctor, along with Dan Bonner, and welcome to Greensboro. You know, Dan, the Duke Blue Devils are known for their defense, but they're also the best shooting team in the country. Duke gets great shots. They convert great shots. And somebody that doesn't really get a lot of credit for the Duke Blue Devils is one of their best shooters, their second leading scorer, sophomore guard, Thomas Hill. I'll tell you what, if he's shooting the ball well, this Duke team can be absolutely scary. And one of the scariest things about the Duke Blue Devils is their ability to get out on the fast break. It all starts with rebounding. Great rebounding position, what coaches call the rebounding triangle. You get the ball off the board, you get it to the point guard, Bobby Hurley. He takes it down the middle of the court. People like Brian Davis and Christian Leitner fill in on the wings. And for the Iowa Hawkeyes or anybody playing the Duke Blue Devils, you better be able to get back. You better be able to play defense because Duke is going to come at you like this all day long. Dan, I know in talking to the Duke assistant coaches, they feel rebounding will be the key to this game. They're very concerned with Iowa's Chris Street, the third leading rebounder in the Big Ten. At 6'8 and 200 pounds, a tremendous rebounder, particularly on the offensive end of the court, an extremely hardworking kid. And one of the keys for Duke, as you say, is going to be to keep Street and A.C. Earl off the board. And the lineup, James Moses had a terrific first-round game against Texas. He joined Street and A.C. Earl on the front line with Smith and Barnes in the backcourt. Tony Lang remains in the starting lineup for Duke, but you'll see plenty of Grant Hill coming off the bench for the Blue Devils. And the officials today, Don Rutledge from Windermere Park, Florida, Dave Bear from Lexington, Kentucky, and Charlie Range from Fremont, California. Christian Leitner will add 20 points, nine rebounds in Duke's victory over Campbell. The ACC Player of the Year and a first-team All-American. A good matchup with A.C. Earl of Iowa. And they'll get this one underway. This is Val Barnes teamed up in the backcourt with Kevin Smith. Earl, Moses, and Street on the front line. Earl, a good low-post player, looking to score early. And he's pushed out of bounds, but apparently he stepped on the end line. Looked like he might have had a hand in his back, but on the turnover, the ball goes over to Duke. Duke in the man-to-man -man defense. Val Barnes actually ran into A.C. Earl, knocked him out of bounds. Looks like I was opening up in a little, little pressure half court, dropping back to see a variety of defenses from the Hawkeyes. Tom Davis likes to change things up. You'll also see a constant stream of substitutes from the Iowa bench. Iowa starts the game in a man-to-man. 1-2-2 -man. Two, two zone is really their main defense. Chris Street is guarding Leitner right now. Ryan Davis nails a three-pointer to give Duke the lead. The Blue Devils as a team were the second-best three-point shooting team in the country, and that's double dribble by Kevin Smith. So two turnovers on the first two possessions by Iowa. Tough way to start the game. That's not the way Tom Davis wanted the game to start. Got to do it on the defensive end as well. There they go. Moses with the steal to Barnes. And he converts to make it 3-2 Duke. 
That's just a very poor inbounds pass. One three one trap by the Hawkeyes. Really not using that trap to force turnovers. Just trying to slow the Blue Devils down. Davis misses a three pointer. Leitner with the offensive rebound. What strength inside. Kevin Smith looks like he might be a little tight. He almost lost that dribble. What a game James Moses had against, well, against Texas, but he makes a mistake here. A player control foul on the third turnover by Iowa. That's the third foul on James Robinson. James Robinson. Seton Hall up by 15 midway through the second half. Henrik Brodel and Pat Sullivan check back in. Hubert Davis trying to go with a very sore left ankle. We'll get a rest. Here we go. Connecticut, Seton Hall, or rather uh, Ohio State, our second game. Alabama, North Carolina underway right now. The winners of these two games advance to Lexington. The other two teams in Lexington will come out of the southeast region in Atlanta. Those games will be played tomorrow. Michigan will take on East Tennessee State and then Tulane against Oklahoma State. Hubert Davis getting a rest. 16 points in the ball game. Davis is getting a rest on the defensive end. You can bet that if necessary, Carolina's going to put him back on the offensive end with that sprained ankle. They still need his presence out there offensively. Two and a half to go. The lead is nine. The Tar Heels trying to go to the Sweet 16 for the 12th consecutive year. Robinson. Yes! you got to go to him. Six-point edge. Moore trying to help defensively, and there's the open man throws. Spread the floor, move the ball. That's what Carolina's going for in these last couple of minutes with a lead. Hard to beat him. Another three-pointer. Well, Webb Sanderson will like to exchange three for two for the rest of the game, but he's only got 139 left. Hey, let's not give up on Bama yet. It's a five-point game, 139 to go. But uh, let's uh, take another look now at Seton Hall in Missouri. We've been able to get our picture back, although we have no line of communication with our broadcast truck. So we'll call it from here as Anthony Peeler hits the jumper to cut the Seton Hall lead to 10. Full court pressure man-to-man, -man, and another team that's not very deep, Jim, is Missouri in the fact that they haven't been able to go to a bench as Seton Hall has, so now trying to make a comeback takes an awful lot of energy to do it on the defensive end of the floor. Terry DeHare makes it easy for him by putting up his shot. Right now, you want to go inside with the ball. 64-54, Seton Hall, Missouri on the drive and player control foul against Peeler. Eight minutes, 18 seconds remaining in the game in Greensboro. Jim, you've got uh, Jerry Walker in the ball game right now, and I think that if you're making Missouri chase you out front, you have Jerry Walker down in low. Caver can deliver the ball. DeHare can deliver the ball. It's good to spread the thing out and then look for Jerry Walker down inside, really make Missouri work on defense. And Reggie look. Smith out, out there trying to put some pressure on at the point. And his last minutes, Jimmy, there's Winchester. That's the guy you want to foul. Seton Hall is a good free throw shooting team, almost 73% on the season. And everyone out there except Winchester is very, very good at the line. But, Mike, you remember the game against Villanova at home this year where Seton Hall just uh, blew it from the free throw line in the last two minutes? And Seton Hall has had games this year, Jimmy and Billy, where they have had trouble closing out and finishing off the point. You see what, what happened right there? They went down inside, and the team is trying to chase you. You can't get that ball. Uh, you can't press on the outside and cover the inside as well. Jerry Walker makes it 66-54, Seton Hall, 740 remaining in the game, and we've lost the picture. So we've lost the picture again from Greensboro. How about fantasy basketball? <laughs> Jim, <laughs> make it up. Take, you know, take feel, us right through. I feel You've like I'm watching before. the Orange Bowl. Listen, uh, everybody <laughs> has that dream of broadcasting a game they can't see. Go ahead. All right, they're coming out of the timeout now at... Uh, Cincinnati, 57-52 Carolina, but we've plugged the picture back in. Up 14 up. Yep, Seton Hall's lead 68-54 now. Well, we
we had the, the problem the other day was the tornado. What's the problem today, Jim? Well, I don't know. Power outages on Thursday. Uh, the AC went out earlier today. That's AC Earl of, uh, of Iowa. <laughs> Well, we need to put it on DC. Jerry Walker unhappy with that call. Said he got it with the uh, elbow, but put Missouri on the line. Kudup goes to the line, it looks like. And uh, key in this ball game is when you, and in the NCAA tournament, you know, they played a tough game the other night. Now you have to come back with one day's rest, no bench to work with. And I think that Norm Stewart has done a great job with this team. Not much expected them in the Big Eight preseason. They fashioned themselves a, a solid, solid year. Crude up at the line for Missouri, and again, we are not able to really have uh, an open line of communication with our broadcast truck there. 6.55 remaining in the game, and we understand that it was our truck that's uh, a problem here, and obviously not the arena like it was on Thursday. A timeout on the floor, an 11-point lead for the Hall. Championship on CBS. 6.55 to go in Greensboro. Seton Hall leads 68.57. Let's uh, squeeze in a look now with uh, a minute to go. Alabama and North Carolina. And a three, a three by Robert Ory brings the tide within six. And Alabama calls a timeout just under a minute to go in that one. That was the halftime deficit for Alabama. Meanwhile, back to Missouri and Seton Hall. Ryan Caver to inbound for the Pirates. DeHair missing, but the follow by Winchester, the lone senior for Seton Hall. Well, we lose the feed temporarily. It's back again. We have uh, no line of communication with our production crew there or our announcers. So we voice it over from New York as we now look at Alabama and North Carolina. And Carolina up to eight now with 45 seconds to go. And Vern Lundquist and Lynn Elmore, let's get back to them. Dean Smith has been to the 216, 16, 12 times in a row. Well, for those of you who are just joining us, North Carolina leading Alabama 63-55. 46 seconds remaining in the ball game. And it's been a free throw shooting brigade here in the final couple of minutes for the Tar Heels. Hubert Davis finally misses. Well, I'll tell you, you have to give a lot of credit to the North Carolina defense that kept Alabama off balance all day. That really was the key, particularly the first 30 minutes of the ball. It was the changing defenses. Right. Hubert Davis misses the ball, but then travels with the ball. 23 rebound uh, turnovers now for North Carolina. The lead is a 63-55, under 45 seconds to go. And if North Carolina advances, it'll be 12 in a row in the Sweet 16. Sprewell has had a horrid day shooting the ball. Ori, the other by shot is short. the other end is on Washington that's five so Elliot Washington will foul out of the ball game a junior from Bradenton Florida and Darby Rich will come back in for the final 25 seconds of the ball game Elliot Washington who was the hero of the win over Arkansas in the SEC tournament that three-pointer with two seconds to go that gave Alabama the victory Seton Hall continues to lead Missouri Reese at the line. One shot. Five of seven for Brian Reese, and they get the ball back. Montross knocked it out. So it's going to be North Carolina joining Duke in the round of 16 in the NCAA tournament. The last time they were defeated in this level was in 1980 by Texas A&M in double overtime. This will be 12 years in succession in their 18th straight NCAA tournament. No basket. 
the final 64-55. Dean Smith's team advances to Lexington. And they are 23-9 on the season. North Carolina, the fourth seed, beats Alabama by nine. Connecticut, Ohio State coming up here in about 30 minutes. Right now, let's go back to our New York studios. James Robinson, Hubert Davis, the Chevy players of the game. All right, Burns, so 12 straight years, as uh, they mentioned, to the Sweet 16. Billy, put that in perspective. Well, I don't know if anybody, and I don't think they'll ever top John Wooden seven in a row for national championships, but I don't know if anybody's ever going to get the 12 Sweet 16s wait, again. Wait, wait, Duke's Duke. already halfway there. They well, got six. Well, yeah, 12. They got six, that's all. <laughs> that's like Greg Kubek. You said no one would ever make it to four straight uh, Final Fours. Hey, later didn't make 